Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Workplace Pride 2021 International Conference. My name is David Pollard. I'm the Executive Director of Workplace Pride, and I think we have a lot of people not only in the audience, but dialing in as well. So welcome to everybody who's dialing in. So as you have seen on the video just now, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, the global uh, pandemic are some of the major social changes happening on the world today. We are truly at a crossroads in how societies react to these developments. Workplaces around the world are equally impacted by these events, and it is highly unlikely that we will go back to business as usual. Although it may go without saying to the people in this room today, uh, the LGBTI community is, of course, part of this story as well. Populism continues to be a, have a negative effect on our community around the world. As you've all seen last week, the Hungarian parliament banned any portrayal of homosexuality or transgenderism to minors in educational material or on television. Poland continues to attack the LGBTI ideology in roughly 100 municipalities, creating so-called LGBT-free zones, and the community has no protection from hate crimes or discrimination. In Brazil, there are legal attempts to remove the word gender and any talk of homosexuality or transgenderism from the curriculum. According to the Human Rights Campaign in the United States, in the US in 2021, it will become the worst year for LGBTIQ state legislative attacks as, unpres as an unprecedented number of states are poised to enact a record-shattering number of anti-LGBTQ measures into law. But there is still hope. There are still positive signs of progress as well. In 2020, Costa Rica and Northern Ireland legalized marriage equality as did the Mexican state of Sinaloa this month, making it the 20th Mexican state to do so. Switzerland is likely to pass marriage equality in September. In April of this year, 400 major corporations in the United States, which include dozens of Fortune 500 companies, have come out in support of the Equality Act, which explicitly protects LGBTQ people from discrimination. And just this week, it was announced that weightlifter Laurel Hubbard from New Zealand will become the first transgender athlete to compete at the Olympics, and the first active American football player, Carl Nassib, came out as gay, setting a precedent for professional sports around the world to do away with one of the last taboos. And just Wednesday of this week, uh, this evening, or Wednesday evening, there was a massive show of support in German cities for our community in connection with the Euro 2020 football tournament between Hungary and Germany. So how will we, the LGBTI community, the large businesses and public sector organizations in, in this conference, uh, and our many supporters, how will we come to terms, come to grips with the important crossroads that we're all facing right now? Today we will hear from business and governmental leaders as well as LGBTQ plus people of different backgrounds who have first-hand knowledge of the most important topics affecting us all today. We will explore how decisions about LGBTIQ plus inclusion made at this juncture could impact strategic and investment decisions for years to come. We will also hear our global uh, workplace community, how our global workplace community deals with vastly different laws and cultural attitudes around the world. And on top of this, many people's mind, on top of many people's minds is how the topic of intersectionality binds this all together. So please join us here at Workplace Pride for our first half live conference in a year and a half to identify the obstacles, explore the possibilities, and to collectively determine what the priorities should be to create workplaces around the world where LGBTIQ plus people can truly be themselves. And now before we start, just a few logistics. Uh, for our conference participants calling in, please do add your questions at the bottom of the Zoom page in the Q&A area. They will be read out later by our moderator, Mike Greenwood, who will be sitting over here. And now, though, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for the day, uh, the very talented journalist and television presenter who will be our moderator, Aldi Thunkar. Thank you so very much, David, and congratulations already on, on, on organizing this event. Let me, let me first comment on the fact that we actually have people in the room. Hi, people! Yeah! 
<laughs> missed you guys. And uh, welcome also to the people watching on Zoom. I will be uh, talking to three people first and then I'll be hosting a panel. The three people coming up first, one by one, are a house representative here in the Netherlands, the CEO of Dow Inc. And I will be starting out with the Global Diversity and Inclusion Officer at IBM. Remember to ask your questions in the chat area on Zoom so that Mike can uh, moderate them. And uh, I would now like to, um, to go over to um, our Global Diversity and Inclusion Officer at IBM, Carla Grant Pickens. Welcome, Carla, if you're with us already. There she is. Hi, good morning. Yes, good. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Ha, ha, good morning to you, Carla, and thank you so very much for joining us for this event. Um, let me dive straight into it with you, um, you being the Global Diversity and Inclusion Officer at IBM. Um, IBM has always been a trailblazer with LGBTIQ plus workplace inclusion. Um, what kind of challenges are you facing now from a DNI perspective with the massive changes that are going on at the workplace? Yes, so our uh, workplace, you know, we are really, really grounded in, in really some very core values. And, and one of the three values that are really, really important to us is trust and personal responsibility in all of our relationships. And these are really, really important as we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and the first and foremost, um, IBM has built a culture of flexibility and inclusion. And what that means is we really trust IBMers um, to do what's right for our clients, for our business, but for themselves and for each other. So it's so important as we are moving to what we're creating together around the world as kind of our post-pandemic world, that we're really, really focused on a hybrid workplace. And what that means is that we have to figure out um, how to continue to create um, and gender trust amongst our employees, but also create safe and supportive environments for our employees. And look, we all know that that is going to be in a hybrid way. It also means that both physical and mental health are gonna be important workplace flexibility, putting yourself and your families first, that's gonna be really, really key. So this kind of whole concept of um, whole self, you know, is gonna be really key to extend beyond, you know, just the employee themselves, but their entire life ecosystem. Yes, I, I can imagine though, Carla, that when everybody is at the office as they used to be, it's easier for an organization to keep an eye on how these things go, but what if, how do you deal with that when people working from their attics, from their cars or from wherever they're working these days? How can you still uh, maintain what it is that IBM wants the workplace to be? Yes, yeah, so um, we've been spending a lot of time in looking at this from an inclusion perspective because we know people can feel very isolated. Um, and so we have gone through and we've taken advantage of this time because we've been remote for a little over a year to redesign our office spaces. Um, so when and the when, the where and the how people will get work done, um, we're really trying to build um, more agile offices, more interactive offices where everybody checks in like today, but you would actually have physical seats of check-in where you could have visual uh, representations and avatars of yourself or physically uh, a video of yourself from a feed so that it could be engaging like you're in the room. We're also ensuring that those that won't return to work or those that will be hybrid, that we do so in an engaging and a safe way. So we're doing re return to workplace details to our managers and employees, bringing them every step of the way, having them co-create with us. And we're also developing um, a leading inclusive guide for managers in the workplace to really guide them through discussions one-on-one -on -one so they can really customize prescriptive plans for their employees because each person won't have the same, same, same situation, home situation, life situation that'll be important to them. Exactly. So those are just a few things that we're doing. 
It's almost sounds like a fun place to work, but I'm too independent for IBM. Uh, recently, IBM did a global jam session on LGBTIQ um, workplace inclusion. That was uh, done with the contribution of the Workplace, Found, uh, workplace Pride Foundation. Um, what were some of the findings from that session, Carla? We learned so much. I, I think the main takeaway um, that came out of the jam, uh, as well as the Institute of Business Value study was, Discrimination based on sexual orientation, um, it still exists. Uh, there's still a lot we need to do to continue to stand up. It is a journey that we have to continue to make around systemic change um, in the places we live and work. 45% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual respondents who were surveyed stated that their um, employers still had um, workplace discrimination as a main factor um, in the workplace based on sexual orientation. So look, we're really looking at four key areas that we recommend business to focus on. One is you have to institute non-discrimination policies and practices. This means that you have to set clear expectations for employee behavior through how they engage with one another and really a commitment to workplace safety. This means bullying, harassment and retaliation free zones across your organization. And this means enabling and educating and training in these areas and giving examples of what this looks like when it's bad, how to respond and how to act and how to be an upstander and an ally and how to get help and seek help. We also have to make sure that the pipeline and all levels of leadership represents everyone. And so this is what's very, very important to us is that we have leaders who are gonna speak out and stand up and be representatives of their diverse communities. That's really, really key. And we'll continue to use our brand eminence uh -huh. as tool for positive change. And that means we're gonna role model this for other companies and uh, partner with them on this journey. I was so proud to speak um, to Congress, virtually fly in on behalf of IBM as the company selected with the human rights campaign supporting the Equality Act. Congratulations. We'll continue to do this work and it was an exciting, exciting time yeah, um, yeah. as we really began to continue our fight uh, for equal rights yes. across the US and the world. I, I didn't hear you mention accountability though. How, how, how does that fit in? Accountability is really key. And what that means to us at IBM is that we are measuring prog progress. We have given goals to our executives across the world that they will be measured and incented based on their improvement in key diversity goals. But we also measure that accountability based on growth year on year, where we set these goals in all of our diverse communities. So that is exactly um, right. Accountability is absolutely key at the very senior levels of your leadership. They yeah. must uh, lead by example. Excellent. Um, the topic of intersectionality will be addressed in more detail later in this conference, but what role do you feel this plays as companies begin to reassess uh, their DNI efforts? Yeah, so look, we have to be intentional uh, with intersectionality. And, and, and I think we saw that so much last year uh, at the inception of the pandemic. And as we began to look at human rights and social justice and racial justice around the world, um, we just can't assume that this is naturally going to occur and that people are going to naturally support the identities of others in the way in which their identity intersects across various groups. Mm -hmm. So we have to ensure that we value uh, and we, ex we really support these different experiences for various diverse groups. So it's important that organizations to continue to work around intersectionality and go a step further. Um, it means creating an inclusive culture where employees can bring their whole selves to work. And in the way in which we've just recently um, have done this is um, last week we did a session for Pride Month at, at IBM. And we talked about the intersectionality of race and how that may vary 
if you are LGBTQ plus. And that really meant um, sharing experiences, um, IBMers share their voices and their perspective, perspectives of how that looks and how it could show up at work. Yeah. And once they leave the office because their lives continue. So we continue to recognize and, and celebrate that. And we also celebrated Juneteenth in the US um, last week and during Pride Month. And we um, had to um, uh, focus in on celebrating many different people, Black gay men, um, as one of the constituencies uh, that share their stories during Juneteenth in the Black community. Juneteenth celebration. So we're crossing over every way we can. Sounds great. Uh, I'm going to walk over to the, the chat area now, Carla. I don't know if you can okay. see me. Um, in, in, the, in the chat corner is, is Mike on the mic, Mike Greenwood. Uh, okay. How's things going in the chat area, Mike? It's a little bit quiet, so I might ask somebody in the audience to, to I won't go so close to you, I have a boom mic, but uh, initially we have a good question and it's to Carla about the IBM Jam session. So the audience uh, online would like to know a little bit more about the IBM Jam session and what it uh, okay. does. Can you fill us in on, on that, uh, Carlo? Tell us a bit about the Jam session. Yeah, absolutely. So a Jam session is an opportunity for IBMers, academe, nonprofit, business, anyone around the world to join us in a 24-hour Jam. Uh, we have hosted topics that are hosted by uh, different organizational leaders, and we actually do normally about six topics, and people can come in and they can share their point of view on this topic. So I hosted allyship in education as the, one of the six topics. We had over 5,000 people to join the jam over that 5, course of 24 hours. Yeah. Excellent. Sounds really great. Uh, t tell us a bit more. How did it go? It went really well. And as a result of it, we were really able to share back out the results of the jam. We uh, posted the results um, and the link to it on LinkedIn. And this was able to allow us to get really actionable about the next steps around educating empl employees um, in business, around the LGBT plus community. It was a way in which um, we were able to shore up and we found out um, that career development was really, really key. That the LGBT plus community was finding that co progressing their career once they were in their company was becoming stagnated. And that companies needed to pay attention to this community to ensure career velocity and growth was happening and the opportunity to grow their career at all levels was really key. So that was a great finding in that a jam session. Fantastic. Uh, looking at Mike, any other question, Mike? Uh, just one more question for Carla, actually. I mean, personally, to Carla, what did she feel was significant about the findings of the IBM jam session for yeah, herself? Well, yes. Well, well, on a personal note, Carla, what, what, what did you take away from that session? Um, I think on a personal note, what I took away was that there are still many challenges people face with um, being invisible with their identity. Um, that was really, really troubling for me, that they felt that if in any way that they exposed uh, anything about their personal life or their, or their gender expression or their identity in any way, um, that they really felt uh, that they would face a lot of discrimination and a lot of support in the workplace. And that, that continues to be troubling. And um, within my jam, um, I had many people that asked the question uh, to many, um, what was a way in which that they could come out um, in a brave way and seek and get support in their workplaces? Yeah. And so there was a lot of encouraging words and examples of that. So that was personally something um, that was just really eye-opening for me but really saddened me that um, people have to continue to be invisible. Yeah. Um, and I want, you know, I want to see a time in which we don't have to do that and we could be our authentic selves. Well, now you, well, now you know, so you can't say you didn't, so now you can work on it. Um, yes. Thank you once again so very much uh, for joining us because I know it's early morning uh, where you are. Thank you very much, Carla. Carla Grant thank Pickens. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carla uh, Pickens at IBM.
We got a couple of polls as well. Is that in the same uh, Q&A area? I didn't know. It's on the side. Just look on the side of your screen. Uh, let's do the first poll now. The question is, at this crossroads in society, what should be the priorities of large international employers when it comes to LGBTIQ plus inclusion? And the options are one, solidify internal policies and practices, two, set an example by being vocal in the media, or three, work behind the scenes to support LGBTIQ plus friendly legislation. Go ahead and fill it in. Let's see what the results are. Um, option one seems to be very much uh, winning here, but we're still working on filling up this uh, poll. But we're going fine, right, Mike? Yeah. It's option one, the one to solidify internal policies and practices. In fact, this is what we were talking about uh, with Carla just now with her jam session. That's exactly what she was doing at the time. I think this is about it. So uh, in the order I named them is the order that you think are, are important. So uh, thank you for filling out this uh, poll and there will be more coming up. In fact, right now, I'm going to give the floor to the next uh, person to lead a segment of this program. Please welcome for panel one, Bianca Nijhoff. She's a board member and a director of Workplace Proud Foundation. And she will be talking with two people about the theme, the impact of LGBTIQ plus workplace inclusion on investors. Bianca. Thank you, Aldith. And so we just learned about that you find it important also to, for companies to look at their policies related to LGBTIQ+. And this panel session now, we are actually going to look at how, how does the outside world also influence companies. So what do investors ask of companies and how do companies react to that? And I have really the pleasure to have two experts with me. Rodney here. Um, in, in, I would, wanted to say in the studio, but it's in a beautiful theater here with us. Rodney is the Chief Operating Officer of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And online, we have Maria Marcia Baliciano, the Director of Corporate Responsibility at Relics. So, we have many issues now we have to deal with. This climate change you see happening. There's a lot to do about gender equality. Black, Black Lives Matter, and you see that investors have become hypersensitive to these issues, so from a, from a sustainability perspective. But how prepared are organizations really to this higher level of scrutiny? So what are the policies in place also when it comes down to LGBTIQ+. Um, what are the main steps organizations should take or could take to ensure to, to, to live up to these, these, these challenges investors are, are actually putting them to? Um, and to ensure that they're not left behind in these changes which are taking place at the moment. Can we gather data on LGBTIQ+, it's a very sensitive topic, but if you as an investor want to judge an organization, do you have to gather data? Um, and, and, but how to do that? Um, so as said, a panelist will look at this from a regulatory perspective, but also a corporate angle, certainly also bring the personal angle uh, to the discussion. So as said, Rodney, with the World Business Council, so an organization, about 200, I believe, by now, businesses, all wanting to work on sustainability. Um, what are, when you hear the topic of, this, uh, of this, this panel session, what are your thoughts about that? Um, when I first uh, was invited to speak, I was a little bit surprised to see LGBTI plus inclusion or diversity inclusion in general associated with sustainability. Um, but I can understand the reasons why. Um, at the World Business Council, we have been around for 26 years, and we are trying to help companies transition to a more sustainable uh, world. That means getting companies to understand their material impacts and dependencies on nature and society, and to uh, innovate and seize the opportunity presented by the development agenda to embrace the, the change that's really needed. At WBCSD, we, we've developed a, a, a very forward-looking document called Vision 2050, which has just gone through a, a, a revision, if you like. Um, and what we are concluding from um, the companies that we've worked with on this journey is that there are three priorities that businesses need to embrace. The first is the climate emergency, which is a no-brainer. So if anybody here is a climate denier, they'll come speak to me later. Um, 
if the, the other big area that we've all been um, a victim of in the last 12, 12 to 18 months is the biodiversity loss, because let's face it, COVID has its origins as a zoonotic virus that's made its way into the human population from us disrespecting natural security. Um, but the third area is inequality. And inequality is an extremely big word and can mean many different things uh, to many different people. But we do have inequality today with LGBTI plus people. As already been said, there are over 70 countries where um, people's sexuality is seen as a criminal um, issue. I'm from Northern Ireland, and in spite of what was said earlier about us having marriage equality, we actually have a ruling government and party that recently put into Parliament a vote on conversion therapy. So discrimination does exist. And I can therefore see why sustainability is a, a, an ally, if you like, of, of, of LG, LGBT plus in, inclusion. If we look in at investors, investors want to make sure that businesses are doing the right thing. And we've seen that a policy means nothing. Having, having a diversity and inclusion policy means absolutely nothing. I could change my name to Brad Pitt, but I assure you he's not looking back in the mirror. So just changing something to say, we are inclusive, we are uh, um, a, a diverse organization, is meaningless unless it is followed through with action. And we've seen exposures of that in the last 18 months. We saw what happened in Brunei, we saw the changes that were brought in that were deeply worrying, but yet many large multinational companies not a million miles from where I'm sitting, were silent, in spite of having policies to say that they were inclusive and diverse. So this draws parallels with sustainability. Hmm. Every company says that they're on a journey to sustainability, but it's not about the journey, it's about proving that you're on the right track and that you know what destination looks like. And that is the same when it comes to LGBTI plus inclusion or any form of inequality. So my advice, really, from, from, um, from my work at the World Business Council is, is walk the talk. Don't just put it on paper. Demonstrate that you live by the values you've set for yourself. That is no different than we would have in, in sustainability, yeah. which is if you're going to set a net zero target by 2050, great, but show us how you're going to get there. Tell us the challenges and the opportunities. Show us that you're working in partnership and collaboration with others. Demonstrate that the words mean something. And investors demand better. Ask for this information. Ask for evidence that this is not just a token, but actually is happening. Thanks. And talking about an organization who at least is, is showing that, I would say, uh, is a true champion on LGBT, LGBTIQ plus uh, inclusion and actually uh, scores well on the Workplace Pride benchmark, Marcia. You are with us online, and I'm looking at the big screen now, waiting to, to, for you to show up. So you're the, the uh, Corporate Responsibility Director at Relics, and is Marcia with us already? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you loud and clear now. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful to have you here. So you're really a true champion on LGBTIQ+. Inclusion have scored high on the uh, Workplace Pride Global Benchmark. So from your perspective, uh, Rodney just passionately told us you can say you're doing it. How are you doing it? Yeah, uh, it's a very important point. And um, thank you to Rodney for making it. Thank you, Bianca, for hosting the session and to all the colleagues at Workplace Pride for inviting me to participate today. Uh, first, just a word about Relax for those who may not know us. Uh, we are the world's knowledge company and we're about data that makes a difference. Uh, we combine data and analytics and events to advance science and health, to protect society and to reduce inequality, to further the rule of law and access to justice and foster communities. We're about 33,000 people uh, around the world and in fact operate in about 40 countries. Uh, we're committed to universal sustainable access to information and mobilizing our skills and resources to make a positive impact. Um, our um, inclusion policy, and I'm very mindful of what Rodney has just said, um, policies are great for putting you on the record, but it's what you actually do that has the, the, the impact. 
So, uh, but R says that we're committed to a diverse workforce and an environment that respects individuals and their contributions um, and a place where everyone, including um, people of uh, all backgrounds can thrive. It seems rather appropriate uh, to me that in a week where here in the United Kingdom where I'm based, Alan Turing, the brilliant mathematician and computer scientist who made tremendous contributions to knowledge, uh, but yet who was really hounded for his sexual orientation, uh, is now appearing on a 50 pound notes. I think this is a really important signal. Um, this agenda matters. Uh, we need to attract and develop and retain the best people, and that means everybody. So I think uh, having the right policies is one thing, uh, but we need to translate those into having the right atmosphere across our organization. Uh, one of the ways that we're trying to do that is through different training, um, including uh, work around psychological safety, allowing people um, the ability to say what needs to be said, uh, not to be feeling that um, there is groupthink or that they are not able to bring their whole selves to work, as we heard um, the excellent colleague from IBM saying a few minutes ago. So uh, we also need to advocate. Um, so I think if you look at our organization um, in terms of gender, you know, it's uh, not too bad. Uh, we're 45% um, women on our board. We're 51% male, 49% uh, women in total. Um, and across all managers, 43% uh, of them are female. We've got more work to do at the top of our organization where only 31% are uh, women. But uh, we've set some inclusion goals for the first time this year. We put them in the public domain in our reporting, which you can see on relics.com in the corporate responsibility section. And among those inclusion goals are um, some articulation of things that we want to do on LGBTQ+. That includes improving the data collection, including by allowing employees to self-identify we need to have clear action on fostering an LBGTQ plus supportive workplace, which needs to be tracked through employee surveys and participation in relevant and external benchmarking. Uh, we also have a kind of catch all category um, and we have other goals, not only related to gender, but also um, looking at uh, issues around disability, but we have this kind of all encompassing area, which is around establishing minimum global standards um, in terms of uh, working policies, parental leave. We need to have impactful global inclusion training and to track the effectiveness of that. We need to do that through employee surveys. And we also need to have engagement across the organization with leadership, as well as grassroots employee participation, including through a very uh, robust employee resource group network. Uh, last year, we had a wonderful ERG conference. It was called Emerge. Um, LGBTQ plus was definitely on the agenda and more than 1500 colleagues participated over two days. Um, that's really fantastic. We need to uh, capture the energy and the excitement uh, in the organization and see that translate into change. And one of those catch all workplace um, goals for us is to uh, make sure that we do the benchmarking externally, but we also disclose. So that's going to help move the needle. We have to be honest about that. Now, yeah. Bianca, you mentioned that we're we're not doing badly in terms of the global benchmarks. Um, Workplace uh, Pride awarded us 93.8% in their 2020 ranking. Um, in Germany, we uh, were recently accepted into Pride 500. And in the US, uh, one of our operating businesses, uh, LexisNexis Legal and Professional, uh, recently received a score of 100 out of 100 um, in their human rights campaign. And something I've heard Rodney say before, which I really believe is true, this is a human rights issue um, and we, we can't lose sight of that. I also just want to flag uh, something for Elsevier uh, because uh, this year uh, Elsevier has launched their SSRN Pride Month Hub to highlight early stage research related to the pursuit of equal justice 
equal opportunity and greater acceptance for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning individuals. And SSRN is Elsevier's world leading platform, which is devoted to the rapid worldwide dissemination of early stage research. And it's committed to advancing societal progress through quality knowledge and education, and it's free to download and upload. And uh, let me just also flag another resource, which I um, uh, will put in the, the chat function, which probably people won't see, but maybe we can share. And that's the RELICS SDG Resource Center. We are a strong proponent of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, among those are uh, reducing inequality, and, and that really fits quite well. And you can find a lot of really great research and content around um, the issue of sexual orientation and inclusion. Thank you. Now, the theme of this Thank session, you, I know, and I'll close so we can get to the important Q&A, is around, you know, what do investors think? Um, I can say, you know, as the person that is um, working on ESG issues with investors, that it's something that we are asked about in terms of the inclusive workplace that we're trying to create, um, but maybe they could do more work on segmenting out um, particular aspects of inclusion mm -hmm. and, and, and what we are doing. Thank you, so, Marcia. Um, so that, that's actually very impressive what you're doing. And even with your relation with investors, investors now slowly starting to ask for this. Um, I wanted to I come back to you later. I wanted to ask Rodney another question because you're also, I know you have been leading the reporting matters within WBCSD, which is a lot about reporting, not necessarily, but in the end, that's the data which investors use. What have you seen, have you seen, how have you seen investors using that? And, and what about the equality subject? And as Marcia said, we have an SDG related to that. So on inequality, what do you see happening in that space? Well, there's no such thing as ESG investing. We should probably clear the air and get that out of the way, first of all. Mm. Investors make decisions based on information that they have available to them. So within the space of investing, there is a growth, albeit not at the scale that there needs to be, on what we call ESG analysis as part of the investment decision-making process. Maybe ESG is environmental. Environmental, so. social and governance. Yeah. Another way of saying sustainability, but it's sexier for investors to call it ESG. Businesses call it sustainability. And to be honest, it's still very much a gray area. Um, there are over 2000 accepted definitions of sustainability. Um, but at the end of the day, sustainability is doing the right thing, end of. Um, so if we talk about investors, investors will make decisions based on information available to them. That information usually is disclosed by the company, but it can also be based on what may be circulating within uh, social media or within um, you know, you know, general perceptions of a particular organisation. And they make decisions based on the information about whether or not a company is worth investing in. Um, we're starting to see that ESG information is being part of that information flow. The problem today is that even in things like climate change, which has been very well researched and which is accepted, you cannot really compare company A with company B because there is no universal way of comparing. Unlike financial information, which is regulated by financial reporting standards, you can sort of compare company A with company B. In sustainability, not so much. Um, and so investors are starting to ask questions to get that clarity. Um, and as I said, the things that they're really focusing on are the transition to low carbon economy and how a business is integrating um, that transition into the way in which they go about their core activities. They're starting to ask questions about biodiversity, particularly for companies that are engaged in um, relationships with the, the physical work earth. So if you are a forest company and you're cutting down trees, then the people that invest in you want to know that you're doing that responsibly. When we get into um, the social side, it's even worse because being able to measure the impact that you have on society is exceptionally subjective. And even when we talk about human rights, if you're working with a company in the Middle East or in Southeast Asia, their view of what is a human right may be different to what you have here in the Netherlands. And so there is, there is a, a need for, for better 
clarity. There's a need for better information. And investors need what is known as investor-grade information, i.e. information that they can rely on, that's available as and when they need to make those decisions. So how, how and today, we, it's a bit of a mess. And how do investors do that with gender? And then I come back to you, Marcia, because I want to know how you did it. But, but well, so with, gender, actually, is it maybe is the, the next step would be LGBTIQ+, right? Well, when, when you look at a report, gender is still binary. Um, and in some jurisdictions, it is a legal obligation to report number of men versus number of women. Um, you will see that in the composition of the board. But we now know and should accept that gender is not always black and white. There are other options. There is the, the non-binary community. But today, I don't believe I have seen any company talk about that, other than in the notion of having an inclusive workplace. Okay. So even measuring what used to be easy to measure is no longer mm -hmm. that straightforward. And in terms of, you know, as a gay man, do I really want to be a number? No, I don't. Um, I've never been a number and don't desire to be one. So there is a, a question around how do you describe yeah. that you are an inclusive environment to an investor audience that is respectful of the fact that we're all human. Um, but there are things to bear in mind that I think are important. More sustainable companies perform better. Now, there is loads of research that confirms that correlation. What we don't know is that there is a causation between being more sustainable and performing better. Mm -hmm. We also know that more inclusive companies perform better. But again, is that because there's a correlation or just can you prove the, the causation? And I think that's where we need to work on, being able to prove that businesses are performing better because they're inclusive, because they're sustainable. At the moment, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to you, Marcia. So how did you use maybe the journey you had related to gender now in, with regard to the matter of LGBTIQ+, and you said you're talking to investors. So how, do, how does, that, does that conversation go, actually? Uh, well, I mean, I agree with Rodney that in many instances it can be a, at the moment an art rather than a science. But I do think that um, investors help to set the pace. Um, the more questions that they ask of senior leadership of, of our boards, then it helps to really uh, move the needle. And uh, I can give you an example of BlackRock, which is Relix's largest investor, and inclusion is, is on the list of topics to discuss. Um, and, you know, I do accept um, that, you know, it can be hard to grade companies um, in this area, but, if, but there are many out there, many entities that are trying to do that. Um, an example would be Sustainalytics or MSCI, or Dow Jones Sustainability Index, or Bloomberg Gender Equality Index on taking one particular measure of, of inclusion, uh, where they're asking for the same data, and they are um, analyzing and, and ranking companies um, in a global universe, as well as companies uh, within a particular sector, because depending on what sector you're in, uh, you're going to have different material issues. Uh, you know, it is a journey for us as it is for pretty much every other um, company that's out there. But I would um, highlight that, you know, we're, we're pleased about where we are today. Um, Sustainalytics, Sustainalytics uh, ranks us first in our sector and subsector. And for example, out of a universe of 13,000 companies, about eight. Um, and we have uh, five years uh, plus of uh, AAA ranking for MSCI, and we want to stay there. We don't want to. We don't want to slip back. And the only way that we're going to stay there because our peers pull alongside us, and and uh, we need to remain best in class, um, is to keep moving forward on the agenda. Because what good looked like last year is not going to be what good looks like um, in the year ahead. So. Um, the, the more we can uh, have quantifiable information uh, that can be factored into investment decisions, I think that's good. Um, I can just give you a, a, an example of something called the Responsibility 100 Index. Uh, Relix is pleased to have scored third. This is meant to look at how companies are doing uh, related to the Sustainable Development Goals. and. One of the things that they ask on LBGDQ Plus is, are you a member of Open for Business? 
uh, we are. And, um, you know, it's it's one of the things that um, entities are, are looking at for, you know, uh, what are you doing in house? What data do you have? But also, how are you advocating externally um, for uh, what you say is important internally? Thank you, Marcia. And I see Rodney, you wanted to react to that? Yeah, I, I, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the obsession that we all have with rankings and ratings. <laughs> um, please don't be. Um, they're important, don't get me wrong, and filling in questionnaires was a job that I did for a long time. Um, I worked at TNT here in the Netherlands, and for eight, seven years in a row, we were the leader on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index to the extent that we scored 100% in 13 of the 16 categories, i.e. perfection, and we were far from perfect. Volkswagen was leader on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index in 2015, seven days before it had to withdraw it. So you have to be very careful about ranking and rating. It's a useful exercise. It's important that people are asking these questions. And a little bit worrying is that some of this feeds algorithms that decide whether or not you should be an invested company or not. So they are important, but they're not all that. One has to take back a step back and say, you know what, having all this armory around you that says, look at me, I'm wonderful, I'm fabulous, you may not be. It, you actually fill in the questionnaire, so of course you're going to say good things. So be very careful of, of, of surveys, be very careful of rankings, be very careful of putting yourself on a pedestal because it can be a very long way down once you fall off it. Most important is about being clear that your policies are not the only thing that needs to be in your armory. You have to live the talk. You have to have a board that is owning the diversity and inclusion programme. And if your board does not own it, then you don't have one that's really effective. It's the same with sustainability. If sustainability is not a universal board agenda item, then it's a hobby. It has to be in the governance of the organisation. It has to be seen as part of the duties of the board of directors to act in the financial mm -hmm. and best interests of the company known as fiduciary duty or in the duty of care that they have under law. So, it cannot be just, you know, a nice thing to do where you once a, month, once a year in June get on a boat in August actually in the Netherlands and have a great day. It's not about that. It's about what happens every day in the office and making sure that at the very top of the organisation they are accountable for what happens further down. One of the things which, because um, yes, definitely I believe in that as well, that it has to be within the board because that's where the, the responsibility lies for this and live it. But um, the rankings, what I heard you say, Marcia, was one of, one of the reasons I think I, I saw you being challenged. Like we were the highest and the others are improving their, in their game, which is kind of pushing you to move on as well. So in that sense, I, I, I see the use of, of, of rankings. And I was just wondering, are you looking to collaborate with your, um, with your peers in this case, or maybe even looking at your own organization? I don't know how far your supply chain is reaching. How are you involving your supply chain, which I think for investors is an important thing as well, to see how are you, you're living the message. Are you involving your supply chain in this? And in that sense, I don't know a good um, synonym for it, but the, the spreading like an oil, the, like, like oil, I still need to find a better kind of synonymous for this, which is more sustainable. But you know what I mean? How, how you're involving yeah. your supply chain in this journey you're on related to DNI and LGBTIQ plus specifically? Well, let me just come back for a minute um, about the rainbow washing or green washing. Um, I fully accept um, something like the DJSI, you're filling out the questions, but the others, they're, they're actually engaging with you and digging in and trying to make it rigorous because if they mess up in their evaluation of you, um, then that's uh, hurting the value of their investments. So I think that um, it, the, the two are increasingly marrying up in terms of the performance, but we don't say how good we are. Um, and in fact, what my message is, is that we've got work to do and hence those inclusion goals. But in terms of the supply chain, um, it's an ongoing effort to engage our suppliers. Uh, we have a supplier code of ethics. It is uh, modeled on our own code. Um, so we try to we set the same standards for our suppliers that we set for ourselves. 
Um, and both of these uh, documents are based on or, or have embedded into them um, the 10 principles of the United Nations uh, Global Compact, uh, which include uh, human rights uh, factors. And so um, we need to be about the stick. So we do um, extensive external auditing, but we also need to be about the carrot as well. So uh, uh, we'll be having, for example, um, a supplier day uh, in a few months uh, where we can hear the challenges of our suppliers across the full spectrum of sustainability, um, as well as on inclusion issues. And, and where can we, what can we learn from them in terms that can help our own journey? Where can we share uh, with them about uh, best practice activity that, that may be able to help further uh, what they're doing, but also within their wider value chain. So it has to be, I think, a, a, a give and take, and we definitely cannot leave out um, suppliers uh, in this. And so we, we try to be extremely rigorous um, in, in how we, we engage the supply chain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just, Rodney, going back to you, because there's about 200 members, I think, now WBCC yeah, has. 200. So Initially, you, in your um, starting statement, you said we can learn from sustainability. So what's the message to, to give along to the audience on, on what can we learn from the sustainability journey we have been on the environmental part for now the social part and specifically LGBTIQ+. Well, sustainability, um, a bit like uh, diversity and inclusion, has been on a journey. And many companies have realized that our obsession with um, shareholder maximization hasn't really brought us all the things that we would really like. We're in a world today after the, the COVID pandemic or uh, coming to the end of the COVID pandemic when companies are starting to question their purpose. They're starting to question how they become more inclusive. So now is a good time to be having these conversations. But the things that we've learned from sustainability are that is what, what uh, Peter Drucker has been telling us for a long time. What gets measured gets managed. And so you do need to look at how best to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of your diversity and inclusion policies. I would like to see large multinational companies that are economically important to countries where I am illegal or where I could be put to death to use their, their influence to start that conversation about behaviour change. It's not about how I feel in my company that matters. It's about, for me, it's about having everybody in the world feeling as if they can be their authentic self. I'm very proud to be Irish. And I'm proud to be Irish because there's been some amazing authors that have come out of Ireland. And my personal favorite was a persecuted gay man um, who actually said, be yourself because everybody else is taken. And I've lived through that motto since I was a very young child. I've never come out because I've never really been in anywhere that needed to come out. And I think that's something I wish that everybody could, could be. Yeah, I've had hard time as a result of it. I've been discriminated against, but it's made me the person I am today. And whilst I'm not proud to be gay, I'm proud of who I am. And that, I think, is what, the, what we can do, is encourage um, conversations within companies to bring the sustainability community together with the risk community, together with the finance community, together with the HR community and the divestor in relations community, and talk about this as the right thing to do, as a value-adding activity, because that's a buzzword from sustainability. Because being able to be yourself means that I can do better at work. And so, the best thing I can recommend today is speak to your sustainability department because they have been on a journey similar to the one that you maybe are on and learn from the lessons that they've, they've uh, experienced. And um, you know, try to measure what you're doing. And most importantly, don't let that be a policy that gathers dust. Uh, make sure that when push comes to shove, like we saw in, in, um, in Brunei, that you stand up and be counted because otherwise the policy is, might as well rip it up. And for people that work in those companies that didn't stand up, that makes you question and trust whether or not you really are working in an inclusive environment. So actually, go to your sustainability department and take their lessons learned. Well, and join the WBCSD, <laughs> because we are about to launch a new project on inequality, and we need you to be part okay. of that conversation. Well, that's a good suggestion as well, thank you. Marcia, last statement from you, and what have you learned and what would you like to take, to give along to the audience? 
in short? Uh, well, I think, um, you know, we have to take stock of where we are. We have to understand, you know, what the picture is inside our organizations um, so that we know how we can be better. Um, Rodney was saying, and I think that's right, you don't want to be um, singled out or, but, but we have to have some type of idea of, of where, of where we are. We can get that in lots of ways, as I said earlier, like hearing from our people, having a culture that truly is inclusive. Um, another one of those, uh, trainings that we do is on uh, courageous conversations. Again, just, um, equipping people to feel like they can say what needs to be said. Um, I, I would also, um, just highlight that we need to continue to advocate, you know, um, indeed about uh, walking the talk and be not afraid to stand up and say these issues matter and um, here's what we're doing about them. So yeah. to be as transparent as possible um, so that we can get better. And that's, that's, the, that's always the objective. Thank you, Marcia. So join me in thanking Marcia and Rodney for this great conversation. Thank you me now, and I'm actually quite thrilled to say that, is the CEO of Dow Inc., uh, Jim Fitterling. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Jim. Thank you so very Good much for, for being our guest today. Thank you, Aldith. I'm uh, very glad to be here. Great. Um, let me get straight into it with you, Jim. Is Dow seeing more pressure to increase its own LGBTIQ plus diversity efforts? Well, I think all companies are. We, we certainly are not different from anyone else. Uh, and I think they're seeing pressure in all areas of diversity, not just LGBTQ, uh, but also in racial diversity, ethnic diversity, and still, still in gender diversity. Um, it's, it's more than just numbers, as we just heard about. It's, it's really about the, the kind of culture and, and the kind of workplace that we create uh, for our employees. Yeah, uh, many people do still think it's all about doing the right thing, but I'd like to know from your perspective, what does a company actually gain from being more diverse and inclusive? Well, I think the, the very simple way that we look at it is we're trying to give our customers a, a great experience and for our employees to have a great experience, that's a big enabler for us to be able to do that. You know, our purpose in the world is to create a more sustainable future for the world by collaborating with all of our partners that use materials in the, in the things that they make. And in order to do that, what we've said, our ambition is to be the most innovative, customer-centric, inclusive, and sustainable material science company in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's about creating an environment uh, where people feel that they can bring their whole selves to work every day. They are working on projects that really motivate them. Uh, they know that they're making a difference, not only for their customers, but the communities that they work in. And they're part of that whole global dialogue that's going on. So if they see us moving forward, they're motivated, they have a purpose, and, and that allows them to move forward and you know, do the things that uh, our uh, customers will reward us for. Yeah, so, so we're now at this crossroads. Where do companies go from here, do you think? Well, I'm optimistic. I, I think we're making progress. Um, I'm optimistic and I hope that we can continue this progress. I think a lot um, is focused right now on numbers as, as we heard previously. And, and there are a lot of actions that are taking place. But one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is focus on culture uh, because we think that, that culture is really what, what it's all about. And culture takes time. Uh, you can legislate numbers, you can legislate representation and diversity, you can, uh, you can try to get there fast, but if it's not sustainable and you don't have an inclusive culture, people ultimately make a decision that they're not happy and they leave. And so you're back to square one again. And we've seen that time and time again. I think we're seeing that right now in, in race relations. You, you know, we're back to where we were, you know, as a, a child uh, in the 60s, I've seen things happening last year that felt like they did in the 60s. And so, you know, we, we haven't made sustainable progress. And I think that's why we believe culture is first and, and matters the most. How, how do we treat each other? Yeah. Uh, how is that sustainable? Do, are we creating a more civil workplace and environment? Uh, are we creating more civil 
government? Are we having the right kinds of dialogue? Uh, those are the big battles that we're fighting today. I think I agree, but with all due respect, uh, uh, Jim, culture for decades has been somebody who looks like you. Uh, so how do we move from that notion to, to this more inclusive notion that, that would actually include all of us? Well, uh, culture, you know, what people look like, I think, is one thing that uh, is an issue. Um, how open we are, how we treat each other is the most basic. I, I would go back to uh, the very simple golden rule. Uh, we have to have some consideration for other people. Um, if we're, we're totally obsessed with ourselves every day, then we're not doing the job that we've been hired to do, which is to think about others and the impact on others. Yeah. And, and I think that focus on ourselves is what drives the polarity that we see in the world. And so it isn't so much how you look um, as, as much as it's how you act and, and how you behave and, and how open are you. I think there's a lot of awareness in the world right now, mm -hmm. but there's not enough action. Yeah, so that, that's where we need to, to, to focus on, on the action to, to take us past this, uh, this crossroads. Uh, let's, let's shift the topic now to uh, uh, lots of companies are bringing back their employees now, uh, post-pandemic. Um, some of them are returning in waves. Is, is this an opportunity, do you think, to relaunch diversity efforts? Are you hearing me, Jim? I think we've lost the communication with Jim. Are you hearing me, Jim Fitterling? No, he's not. Let's have a look. See, Dave, David Pollard, can you can you maybe join me on stage here and and see if um, while the tech the technical crew figure out how to get Jim back online with us. Um, uh, okay, you hearing me again? <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you're back, Jim. Uh, let me let me rephrase my question. I was uh, asking you. Lots of companies are bringing back their people now post pandemic. Uh, and some of them are turn, returning in, in, in huge waves. So is this an opportunity to relaunch diversity efforts? We had a motto uh, through COVID that inclusion uh, is not canceled. And, um, and we used our employee resource groups heavily uh, to keep people connected and keep people working forward. I do think it's a chance to do some things very differently. Uh, we will come back in, in waves as well. Well, one of the things that I was very proud of is we had very regular communications with our organizations right through COVID. And we had an interesting ability to see into people's lives, uh, not in a, in a creepy sort of way, but just, just see what they were dealing with through COVID, whether it was childcare issues, maybe taking care of elder parents, just any number of human things that they had to deal with and understanding the balances and the pressure. So we'll come back with more flexibility uh, the ability for, for many of them to come to office some days and work from home some days, which I think will be very powerful. Mm -hmm. And it will, be, it will be different when we come back. Yeah. There are a lot of people in the organization that want to come back uh, to the office place. They miss that. Uh, they feel like they've been isolated. At the same time, there are others that have different pressures that they need to balance. So, so this, this to me sounds like a, a new way of working. Do you think you can keep that momentum going? I think, I think the work-private balance is something that we do need to look at worldwide. So how can you keep that going? I think we can keep it going. I, I often say, I, I believe we managed through COVID well, uh, and it was very tactical. We tried to keep things running, try to keep product moving for our customers, try to keep systems aligned. I would say if you're trying to make strategic change, that's very difficult to do with everybody remote. So I, I think we have to be more intentional about what we're doing. You're just showing up to the office every day just so that somebody can physically see you sitting there uh, may not be uh, what we're looking for. But if you need to have a strategic uh, get together and get everybody face to face where you have that interaction and you have uh, that dialogue that you need and the and you can read the body language uh, i think that's going to be critical yeah. and then when you're working uh tactically 
uh, you can be working from home and, and dealing with the things you need to deal with. There's productivity in both. And I think we have to be open to different ways of doing things. And, and I asked this question earlier to, to Carla Grant Pickens. Uh, you as a company might have um, protocols in place to make sure that the workplace is a safe one. But now that people are going into a hybrid way of work, how can you, um, from a distance, make sure that those protocols are still uh, adhered to? Yeah, well, you can't. I don't think you can micromanage uh, everyone's life. We're we're obviously a science and technology company, and you know, thankfully, we have access to some very effective vaccines through all of this. I think uh, what we saw with the ramp up of mRNA vaccines and that scientific breakthrough gives people a choice to get vaccinated so that they can have more freedom and, and feel less pressure. We'll do what we can do at work. Uh, we'll monitor and check uh, with employees on how they're feeling. Um, and we've always been good at making sure that we have available health care for them. Yeah. It's it's not it, it's not a zero risk world. There's a little bit of risk in everything we do, but let's make smart decisions together about how we can move forward. That's a really fair point. Uh, if you had to pinpoint one thing that companies can and should do to keep the momentum going to help drive DNI, um, what would that one thing be? Constancy of purpose. Um, I, I built on the last discussion. Uh, the tone at the top is very important. Uh, this is important to my board. We talk about it at every meeting, uh, inclusion as well as sustainability. I think the, the war on talent is going to be one of the biggest challenges we've got, maybe even bigger than the sustainability battle. And in order to fight that, you've got to have the right culture. So the board uh, wants it, I want it, and it has to be every day, every week, uh, part of what we're doing. It has to be very intentional. It isn't a program. It isn't an initiative. It needs to be the fabric of the company. The DNA and, uh, even, yes. The DNA, it yes. has to be. Yeah. And, and people, when people make their judgment about how you're doing, you know, there are a lot of metrics out there. One of the most important ones to me are, are people engaged and, and are people happy where they work? And when you're starting to see those numbers move in a positive direction, where you have you know real life touch and feel of, of that, you know if people are motivated or not. We had a lot of uh, you know outside issues last year on top of COVID. We you know we had some weather events and some flood events here in Midland, and and the way that the team responded and and went out to work um, volunteer in the middle of COVID, went out to work in the communities and volunteer, I think says a lot about the culture, is um, they, they're a part of the community and it, it was important to them. And so they picked up and they did it. You, you can't replace that. Those are the things that happen every day that don't come from a top down order. They're just natural. And that's when you have activity like that happening, that's when you know the DNA is, is in the right place. Sounds fantastic. Let me move physically to my little spot for some Q&A. Mike on the mic, how's it going in the, in the question area? It's, it's going very well. I'd like to put a question from the Zoom audience to, uh, to Jim and particularly to, to Dow itself. Um, the, the chat is asking what uh, active initiatives uh, are being put into place from Dow uh, towards cultivating safe spaces or working groups comprising of LGBTIQ plus people? Um, perhaps like a space to discuss triggering situations uh, that have happened or can be anticipated and how community can stand up or react in these situations. We have, um, through our employee resource group network, we have um, chapters of our, <clears throat> of our GLAD network in almost every country that we uh, operate in. And what they have is uh, frequent gatherings um, and places where they can have those types of discussions. And actually, I, I think it's a good lead in. I mean, that was why the organization was put together in the first place was to create a safe environment to have that discussion. And we use those employee resource groups to be a sounding board for us, but also to be our eyes and ears to what are the issues that LGBTQ plus uh, uh, people are dealing with. Um, and then we take those and we, we put them into actions. And in some cases, uh, we're advocating for uh, action at the political level on things like marriage equality, 
uh, right now on the Equality Act in America, like the uh, National Employment Non-Discrimination Act that we're trying to push through with uh, a human uh, human rights campaign. So I, I think we've got um, the capability to do that and leaders, leaders as well who may not be well versed in dealing with those uh, questions have a place to go. Yeah. Mike, I have room for one, possibly two questions more. Okay, we have, do have one more question at the moment, and it's uh, on the topic of trans transgender issues and uh, the measurement of inclusivity and how to count that, especially with Jim and Dow, um, to measuring the quality of coming out support at a company and how that helps transgender people in the workplace. We have uh, 16 years consecutive of uh, perfect scores on the Human Rights Campaign Corporate Quality Index, and one of those things that you have to do is have a very effective program at, at handling transgender issues. Dow has a transgender playbook um, for human resources and for people leaders on, on how to deal with situations, and we've had uh, some successful transitions happen at Dow here in America, in Brazil, in uh, and in our operations, uh, part of the organization, and they and they worked very well. We've actually put that uh, playbook out through our Glad network to other companies that are trying to figure out how to deal with it. And I think we've we've done a good job with them. We talk about it uh, at work. We we talk about right now pressure against these anti-trans bills that are happening in the United States. And I think we've been effective at raising the voice and the awareness for those employees. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Mike, as well. Uh, keep those questions coming for the rest of the program. For now, Jim, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, the best of luck with Dow. Uh, we're proud to have had you here on the program this day. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, happy Pride, everyone. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. That was Jim Fitterling, CEO of Dow. Uh, time for a new poll. Yes, a new poll. And the question now is, what do you think that employers should do next regarding LGBTIQ plus workplace inclusion? And your options are one, leverage on the younger generation's outlook to make progress. Two, integrate LGBTIQ plus inclusion in all global activities. Or three, give greater support to civil society as an agent of change. Those are your options. Please fill in the poll and what we can see happening is to integrate uh, the uh, inclusion in all global activities. This is the way that you can actually uh, have agency and have impact according to the people filling out this poll. Let's give it just a couple of seconds more. Nothing moving. I think it's safe to say that that is the conclusion of this poll. Thank you very much for uh, helping us out with that. Good to see you again. We've met before. Yeah, good to see you, Aldis. Yes, lovely. Yeah, I really like your hair, by Thank the way. You. Thank you. It's all natural, not a pin in there, not even gel. It's just dreadlocks keeping I'm themselves impressed. in place. You can rent them from me if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, uh, let's dive, dive straight into it. When, while campaigning, you focused on giving transgender and intersex people more say in their medical procedures. Um, do you feel that employers could play a more supportive role for their employees when it comes to that? Yeah, they definitely could. Uh, first of all, they, um, uh, I'm very aware, and I think the people uh, that are here uh, today are aware of that as well, that large company, companies also have an advocating power. So uh, my first suggestion would be to, to use that, to, to advocate uh, uh, low thresholds for access to, uh, to transgender healthcare all over the world. We see it uh, deteriorating all over the world, uh, the, the opportunities for people to, to access uh, transgender healthcare. And that really worries me. So that's, that's an outbound action they could take. Yeah. Um, and um, within their own company, they could facilitate uh, transgender people undergoing uh, surgery, undergoing medical treatment. But so, so how could they do that? Well, uh, it's very simple. You, um, uh, just like maternity leave, you could uh, offer a transitional leave, um, more or less uh, through the same guidelines. Um, and uh, transi transitional leave um, caters for all the stuff uh, transgender people might go through during a transition. So it's not only for medical treatment, but maybe also 
um, yeah, for the social change. Yes, yes. To give them the opportunity to go out this way and to come back the other way. I'm just putting it very bluntly. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, you, you need to take into account that when uh, a, a transgender person uh, goes through a transition, it's not only them uh, uh, going through a transition, it's their environment, uh, their support system as well. Right. You know, uh, partners, kids, friends, family, they all, uh, well... They're all in transition. They're all in transition. Yes. And um, so this transitional leave could also uh, cater for uh, uh, yeah, putting attention to that process. I think it's a very valid point. Um, we, we, we've seen so many societal changes lately, the past year. I mean, it's like, as if the world was on its head. How, how do you feel that the Me Too and the Black Lives Matter movements and even the global pandemic have impacted the transgender community, if, if at all? Yeah, well, of, of course, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, had, a, a, first of all, a huge impact on, uh, I think, uh, loneliness of transgender people. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in the middle of your transition, you might feel awkward uh, to, to go out, to meet people. Um, uh, and maybe, maybe your social circle has shrunken because of your transition. So, um, and then if there are only a few friends left and you're also uh, kept in the house uh, because of the pandemic, then your whole life becomes very, very small. Yeah. So loneliness and depression is a big thing in the, uh, uh, in the transgender community. Yes. And I think that the pandemic uh, uh, increased those problems. So that, that's first of all a huge thing. Next to that, of course, we, we, we discussed healthcare. Um, but the healthcare uh, obviously has been focused on treating uh, uh, COVID patients. Mm -hmm. So uh, the capacity of healthcare systems to cater for transitional uh, transgender healthcare mm -hmm. uh, has also uh, gone down. Uh, so waiting lists increased. Uh, that, that, that really um, made the situation. That must have been horrible. It, it is, yeah. Especially that's what I hear. Especially if from... you're already in transition and, and yeah. then suddenly kept waiting. Yeah. How yeah. do people even deal with that? Well, some uh, really struggle to deal with that. You know, the, 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 the depression and suicide rates among uh, transgender people are high, uh, well, his historically. Mm -hmm. uh, they've always been high, but during COVID, it, uh, it increased a bit, I think. Yes. Yeah. Is, there any, is there any way thinkable to... Because I, I, I'm a pessimist when it comes to the, uh, the pandemic. I, I, I'm sure there's another one around the corner. What can we learn from this one for when it happens again, especially based on, uh, on the lives of transgender people? Well, I think we have all learned that despite the fact that we can't meet physically in a situation like this, we could meet uh, through video, um, and it has proven a very uh, worthwhile endeavor to, to uh, really try that. And, you know, companies uh, have been uh, working on and on uh, through video without physical contact. So yeah. I think we should learn to uh, uh, embrace those ways of being in touch. Yes. And um, maybe we could invent new social structures through video, mm -hmm. so that we always have this, uh, these means of uh, being in touch with each other. Yes. I know there's a lot going on on the tech side of things, mm -hmm. and I know there's, there's, there's complete worlds coming our way for, for, you know, for, for, for lonely people who, who, need, who need this. So maybe we should just hold on. It's, it's coming our way. Uh, let me move on to the next question. Uh, your, your, your portfolio in the House of Representatives also covers ICT, which is why we met earlier. Yeah. Um, is there a link regarding privacy and security issues for LGBTI people to, you know, to ICT? Yeah, there is, but, but, but first of all, um, I'd like to uh, uh, explain that I'm very happy with my, uh, with my focus points in Parliament, because it only for a tiny piece has to do something with trans transgender issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, two of my colleagues, Vika Paulusma and Jeanette van der Laan, both of D66, they are covering uh, emancipation issues, healthcare issues regarding transgender people, and I'm very happy with that, because if I would do that, then I would be the transgender person taking it up for transgender people. And you'd have to, you'd have to be the transgender person 24-7. Exactly, like, yes. like it's a job to be transgender, exactly. and it isn't. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm very happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, well, the relationship between privacy issues and LGBT community, uh, I think, uh, for me, they are very uh, clear and obvious. Uh, it's uh, um, it's a... Um, uh, 
a property of uh, a person, that a person's sexual orientation is just a, a property, just some aspect of a mm -hmm. person. And registra registrating stuff like that is uh, very, very tricky uh, stuff. Um, and that poses uh, a challenge, because if you want to um, develop and monitor specific policies to uh, facilitate LGBT people to uh, find their way in society, find their way in companies, of course you want to be able to identify those people. Yes. But then again... Um, you can't reg register them. Exactly. So that's a challenge, I think. So how, how to go about that? Uh, well, I don't have the answer, <laughs> um, but we should be aware of that. And, uh, of course, if you uh, find a, a need to register it, make sure that people really support that and uh, okay that. Right. Uh, that's, that's the first prerequisite, yeah. I guess. Mm. Because is there another way thinkable of keeping track of who gets the next great job or who gets the next opportunity. Is there another way of doing that other than registering? Well, people? if you're uh, um, fond of figures, then mm -hmm. I think you need to register stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're fond of um, uh, being in touch with people, you don't need figures, you don't need registration. You can uh, be in touch with people and knowing them uh, also gives you the information whether or not they need specific uh, facilities. Yeah. Uh, and th then it doesn't really matter if uh, these facilities are focused on facilitating LGBT people or uh, people of color or women or disabled people. Yes. It, it doesn't really matter. Just focus on individual needs and try to cater for it. Yeah, that does require a, a, a mindset change, though. True. Because figures, uh, my figures have been used against me. They've been used for me, but they've be used, been used against me as yeah. well. So that, that's a difficult thing. Do you, do you feel that technology companies in any way can, uh, are responsible to, to, to help out with this issue, to come up with ways of doing this properly? Um, well, it's, um, um, it's an adventure for all technology companies to take responsibility for, for uh, social equality as well. Digital human rights, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very important issue. And that sometimes uh, 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 creates a lot of friction with economic uh, goals. Um, and some companies uh, uh, succeed in, in taking some resp uh, responsibilities um, and others don't. It's, it's yes. yeah. Everybody's yeah. struggling with it, I think. I think so. Uh, yeah. Yes, society wide, I should think. Yeah. Um, what do you think would be the main change that you would like to see at the end of your own term in Parliament when it comes to how LGBTIQ plus and specifically trans and intersex people are engaged yeah, at well, the workplace? First of all, maybe more on a personal note, I'm very happy that um, uh, me being elected in Parliament uh, created a tsunami of attention of the media. Um, which a tsunami is a, of? Attention of the yes. media. Yes. And that's a good thing because it, it gives me the opportunity to tell the story behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, the story that it's, uh, um, uh, the fact that it's exceptional that a, tra a transgender, transgender person entered parliament tells the story of transgender people in our society having a constant headwind, uh, are not offered as much opportunities, are stigmatized, d d discriminated. Um, uh, so it's important to tell the story, and I got lots of opportunities to, mm -hmm. to tell the story, but I hope in four years nobody ever is interested anymore in the fact that I'm transgender, and everybody speaks about uh, what a great member of parliament I was regarding digital issues. I'm sure yeah. they will, but are you, are you optimistic though? Do you think that you, because you, you came out quite openly about this, mm -hmm. which is a great thing, but uh, do you think this at some point will come back to haunt you? That, like, like you said, you will be the 24-7 trans person in Parliament. My goodness, nothing else ever came from our fingers. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I'm not afraid of that. I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, then again, if it happens and if it's uh, haunting me mm -hmm. uh, and everybody still sees me as the 24-7 transgender person, well, then I just have one thing to say. It's, uh, uh, it's very nice to be a transgender person. <laughs> so if I can be that 24-7, I'm Yay. happy. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Give her a round of applause for that. Um, is there any advice you could give to organizations as well to the community itself when it comes to this? Actually, this part that we're talking about. How can you make the switch from being the 24-7 trans person or the 24-7 trans employee to, you know, here's Lisa and she's great at ICT? 
Yeah, well, there's always this impulse to um, distinguish people, to divide people in groups, because it makes life, um, well, simple. Does it least. really, though? At, at least that's, that's what, what people, people think. think. Yeah. Uh, but it's not helpful in really engaging uh, uh, to connect to people, to connect to needs, to connect to possibilities, to uh, uh, really um, put everybody in, in its power and, and let everybody have the best opportunities to contribute to society, contribute to the uh, company. Um, so stop putting people in boxes. That's, that, but we uh, live in the Netherlands. We, that's we, true. We, we, we're a country of boxes. Yeah, we like to keep the things tidy. Don't uh, we? Yeah, that's, that's but true. But we make a mess in those little boxes. Yeah, and that's something people need to see, that by, by trying to keep stuff tidy, it's messing up stuff as well. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very... Uh, I have high hopes of uh, that someday we, ha we can see that this has, is all something of the past. Um, because... Um, we are a global village, you know, it's, it, we, we are connected to people all over the world. Exactly. Uh, so we are all in a situation to see uh, the uniqueness of everybody, to learn from that and to exchange. You know, for, for me, life is an exchange. Mm -hmm. It's not about uh, setting and achieving goals. It's about the exchange itself yes. that makes life worthwhile. So I hope that everybody, uh, well, will learn that and see that that are you hopeful though that they will because to me there's a, there's two sets of people there's the people who like everything in an orderly fashion True. what they call orderly and there's people like you and me who actually love chaos because from chaos comes order how can we how can we make this this thing interweave well because you know, they are afraid of change you know that yeah yeah, yeah. that's true but um uh change is not something you need to do it happens by itself mm -hmm. um and uh two days ago i i opened an exposition uh, here in amsterdam um about the history of transgender people here in the netherlands and uh in my speech i uh, uh pointed out that hist historians uh, they provide a gateway to our future because they know history, they know where we came from. Um, and regarding this point, I think if, if you look back and for, let's say, look back at the med medieval age, ages, we know that we have improved quite a lot since then. Mm -hmm. And that gives me, uh, well, the conviction maybe uh, uh, that uh, uh, we will go on uh, with yeah. improving. Yeah. Yes. So if you could paint, if you could paint uh, the picture of the world, let's say 20, 25 years from now, on this subject, what would it be in your dreams? What would it look like? Well, I think there will be, uh, of course, some spots uh, all over the world where people are still clinging on to old ideas mm. uh, that won't disappear very quickly, I guess. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that those groups will become smaller and their influence will become uh, less and less and less. They'll be the minority. Yeah, they'll yeah. be the minority. They, 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 for the first time, uh, will be experiencing minority stress. Yes. But we, mu we must take care. The moment you and I say they, we divide ourselves that from is them. True. So that's, that is true. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, and and we can re um, uh, they can rest assured because the treatment that they will receive will be different from the treatment that they're giving others now. Uh, I'm, I I'm, I'm sure of that. I hope that uh, in the future, the former minority groups remind, keep on reminding how it was to be a minority group yes. and that, t uh, that they take on a responsibility not to treat other people like that. So we all have our homework to do. We do. I underscore that completely. Let me go uh, to Mike. Mike on the mic. I I'm sure there's a ton of questions coming in for Lisa. Tell me that's true. First of all, Lisa, thank you for all you've done it's incredible and the questions are very loaded so i hope you don't mind some pointed questions and loaded questions but uh nicolette we give would like lisa to... the right not to answer a question if she doesn't feel like indeed it. okay um so nicolette asks uh to lisa directly um are you coming across gender critical feminist thinking uh in the netherlands um you know around the issue that trans women are not natural women and wants you to to speak to that if you can yeah, I think that uh, uh, the radical feminists who, uh, who um, uh, oppose trans uh, the, the, the increasing of transgender rights, they, uh, they are um, focusing on the wrong enemy, I think. We have quite a lot of uh, challenges in common, so I think we should team up uh, instead of fight each other. I agree. 
One more question. Uh, this, is, this is the most loaded. Um, earlier, Lisa mentioned uh, medical procedures to support the trans community. On the, the other side of that, the flip side, uh, the intersex group for 20 plus years has tried to stop medically unnecessary surgeries. Um, the Dutch government is still not turning these kind of things yeah. into law. Um, what do you think about that and, and where do you think this can progress to a better place? Yeah, I think it's, um, um, it's about time that it, it's, it's, it's uh, turned into law here as well. Um, people should, um, sh should decide for, this, for themselves whether or not they should undergo surgery. It's, it's uh, a fundamental right. It's a personal right. Self-determination yes. is a fundamental right. So um, this needs to be fixed. Quickly. Is this something that you're uh, picking up in Parliament? Well, it's uh, at least uh, uh, on the table within our uh, party. So, we're, we're, yeah, yeah, we have it in uh, on the radar. On the radar, yeah. yes, and, and, and as part of the formation procedure that we seem to be stuck in. I can't tell anything off. Oh, you can't. <laughs> I just, I had to try. I had to try. Yeah, <laughs> Mike, anything else? Yeah, just a follow-up to the same kind of uh, conversation um, to Lisa. What do you think about protections for intersex children and so on, uh, and adults as well, and, and how the Dutch government can forward that? Well, um, f first of all, um, it needs to... Um, uh, the, the dialogue on this should be uh, uh, um, um, facilitated more, I guess. Uh, a few months ago, I spoke to uh, 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 a medical professional who is part of offering medical services to intersex people, and she said, well... Uh, this is, uh, of course, we need to talk about this, but it's not such a, such a really big issue because there are only probably 50 surgeries uh, each year here in the Netherlands on trans uh, intersex children. And then I thought, well, it's not about the numbers. Maybe 50 isn't a lot, but it's, it's a fundamental principle. Um, so um, we should not make it smaller than it is. It's, it's a fundamental issue, and it... it it needs all it attention. needs to be addressed yeah yes exactly. yeah i wonder if there's somebody in the room that you'd like to ask a question because there's they're being so good but they're so very quiet and so very dark and so it's very dark <laughs> maybe we can light up the room just a little bit and have mike go out in the room with his boom microphone yay mike go do it all right um, and just select somebody and they, they just have to answer a question would you like or, to pose or a, ask question? a question or ask a question yes yes Raise your hands if you have a question for Lisa. If you're close enough to come down here and keep the distance, then I will use the boom yeah. mic. And don't be shy, people. Come on, we're among ourselves. Yeah. Anybody? If not, Mike's going to just shove the mic under your nose. So <laughs> it's, it's, either, it's either you do it voluntarily or you'll be forced to. Anybody? Yeah, go on. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and congratulations again, Lisa. Um, if... Uh, uh, if you had your, all your wishes come true in, in, the, in the coalition agreement, um, what, what, what would, what would uh, be written down for LGBTI people? Um, That's a great way of asking the same thing I did. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, well, maybe his question was a bit more clear now. It just, was, yes. Just, <laughs> just teasing you. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, I think um, um, a government uh, should invest more uh, uh, to facilitate a police force to really uh, f fix the discrimination, to, uh, to uh, invest in specialized uh, detectives, um, to make um, our police force a safe place uh, for uh, victims of hate crime, LGBT cri hate crimes. For the people working there or for the people in the public? The that people they, in the public, you that know. They serve. Yeah, yes. yeah, because um, uh, the LGBT victims of hate crime uh, uh, are very. Uh, uh, they, they tend not to go to the police because they feel that their problems aren't addressed properly. And the police suffers from, uh, I think, lack of sensitivity, lack of knowledge, lack of um, knowing what to do. So same as people of color. Exactly, and all the exactly the same. Yes. Yeah. So that, the, the, so money. I think money needs to be be put forward to invest in that. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, um, then on the legal side of things, uh, well, we are in the process of um, making uh, discrimination towards uh, LGBT people. Uh, forbidden in our uh, uh, constitution. It's not in the constitution yet. Uh, well, uh, it's it wasn't clear uh, 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 clearly stated. I see. It was implicit. Kind uh, yeah. Of. Yes. Yes. Sex was mentioned. Right. Yeah. That's right. You mm. could say, well, it's all part of sex. Yes. 
I, yeah. So that's one good thing that's already happening, but need, still needs to uh, some work. Um, and uh, well, we, we spoke about the transitional leave. I think also we should invest in uh, sensitivity and c uh, capacity of uh, healthcare system uh, systems to really cater for the needs of intersex people, transgender people, but also uh, gay and lesbian uh, people as well. Mm -hmm. um, sensitivity on those topics uh, is not widespread in, in healthcare, I think. So it's a whole wide range of stuff uh, we could and should do. There's so much to be done, really, yeah. isn't there? Yes. Yeah, and I'm very aware of the fact that it can't all be done within one year, so... You got four years, though. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope we have four years. Yeah, we, we, have, to, we have to hope for that, yes. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, anything else coming in? Oops, sorry. Oops, watch. Oh, look at the enthusiasm now in the room. Maybe you can step forward. Thank you. Hello, Lisa. I'm so happy that you are here. You're such a role model. Thank can you. you give Workplace Pride a top advice for, uh, what we can do more for the transgender community? Um, Thank you. Um, well, I think that um, me becoming a member of parliament is, uh, well, you, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I became also a role model by doing that. I think that Workplace Pride uh, um, could see if they could invest in making role models, uh, transgender role models within the Workplace Pride community more and more visible. Uh, that would be really helpful because I know they, they, are, they, they are amongst us, uh, amongst you. Um, so making them more visible would be helpful. And one other thing, maybe I, uh, earlier I spoke that companies, uh, especially large multinational companies, have advocacy power. I think Workplace Pride as a network also has adv advocacy power. So maybe you could investigate on um, yeah, putting that forward. It's about visibility, yes. I think I see your hand go up way there, but maybe it's, maybe it's just me not seeing properly. Yeah, I did. Hi, Lisa. Good to see you here. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, one of the members for Workplace Pride is also the Dutch government, the national government. And I would be very, well, I would really like it if the government itself would be an example in LGBT at the workplace. But I think we are not on the top yet. So can you help us in getting the, the government as an employer itself to get to a higher level? Uh, I, I would love to help. Um, don't quite know how, because uh, one first really important no notion is that the government is not some specific thing. It's, it's a whole, uh, well, collection of, of different organizations with different dynamics, with different cultures as well. So um, I think that's also part of the, uh, yeah, well, part of the challenge that, that, that lies ahead of us. Yeah. And any ideas how to go about it? I don't know. Um, being visible, speaking, uh, constantly be speaking the need to uh, set an example as a government. Mm -hmm. um, I, well, uh, yeah, by just saying it like I said it, um, that's the first step. That's I the think the government should, should set an example. Yes, yes. Yes, here's another person. Hi, I think this is a wonderful conversation. And, and also, besides uh, the government being an employer, uh, and an example, uh, I'd like to refer to the ILGA list, um, the ILGA list of uh, countries and how supportive they actually are of LGBT plus IQ topics. Uh, but the Netherlands is not scoring so well. Uh, also not scoring well against, for example, Belgium. Mm. And Malta has been championing in the last year. I wonder what we should do and could do in the Netherlands to actually start leading on this list. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. well, question. Uh, yes. a, few, a few things. Um, one thing I didn't mention on uh, the question uh, Justice uh, asked earlier, and you asked as well, um, uh, that gay conversion therapy is still uh, not illegal and still not forbidden here in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So that's one very specific thing we could do to, uh, uh, well, rise up a bit on the list. Um, it's, it's about time that... that we fix that as well. So it's, I think it's, uh, that's one of the topics, um, getting a ban on uh, not necessary medical treatment to intersex uh, children, you know, just formalizing all the stuff that to us sounds very sensible, sensible and logical to do, but you need to put it, 
yeah, into law to yes. really fix it, that, that we shouldn't be fighting those rights constantly over and over. Mm -hmm. So there were lots of topics to do. Um, and I, I agree, it, I think it's 20 years ago that uh, same-sex marriage was, uh, 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 became allowed here in the Netherlands. Um, back then we were the leading company worldwide, I, a, a country worldwide on LGBT issues. I think we should but strive to... Gone down to yeah, we should strive to become uh, yeah. the leading yes. country again. Which, which, which always seems to baffle me. I think it is 20 years ago. Uh, first of all, it, this was a different world at the time. And, and to me, it seems like many of the, uh, the things that we, that we held to be self-evident have, have somehow slipped away, disappeared, are yeah. under the rug. How, how, do you, how do we get yeah. back to where we were and beyond? Yeah, I think that... Um, um, maybe on a personal level, maybe it, it counts for, for all of us. Um, the one important notion is that the moment you have uh, gained a specific right, don't uh, sit back and relax, mm -hmm. because it's going to be taken away from you if, you're, if you, if you uh, uh, let go of your attention. So you need to stay on top, stay yes. awake, stay yes. alert. Stay visible, uh, yeah, stay vocal, yes. uh, you know, don't take uh, things for granted. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. And we haven't been on our guard, I guess. We thought we had it all uh, yeah. done. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and look what happened. Yeah. I think that's that's a great one. I, I'm going to give uh, Mike one more question to to get to Lisa. Yep. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you're very happy that your portfolio didn't include the emancipation, that someone else is going to do that. And I think that's a very recognizable sentiment that we don't want to be always be the one gay person who's driving all of the gay activities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do you have ideas about how we can balance that to make sure that progress is being made? So there's that we need to be visible, we've said that a few times, and I think finding that balance for many of us is always a challenge, that you're in an organization, you want to fit in, you want to be a part of the organization, you want to be known for your qualities, not necessarily for your LGBTIQ plus status. So what are your thoughts on how do we draw the right balance to make sure that progress is being made and support those that yeah. are doing that yeah. and not just taking a back seat? Right. Yeah, very good question. I think, first of all, it's, um, it's a personal decision, an individual decision uh, to uh, whether or not to uh, speak up and speak out and advocate uh, uh, LGBT issues within your organization. Um, everybody should decide for themselves. Uh, years ago, I decided that I wanted to be visible as a transgender person because I uh, felt that I had something to contribute, to um, pave the way for others, uh, to inspire people, and also to slap a few uh, people in the face uh, to make way. Um, that's part of my, my role. Um, but uh, there's also strength in... Um, not making your work of uh, LGBT advocacy. Uh, uh, because if you, are, you, if you are an LGBT advocate, then you constantly speak about it, uh, but it's also very powerful not to speak about it and live it and show it. And that's, um, that's why I'm happy that um, LGBT rights, transgender rights, aren't part of my uh, portfolio in, 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 the, in Parliament. I don't have to talk about it. I'm, I'm doing it right now, but I don't have to talk about it. I, I'm living it. Yeah. And it gives me also the freedom to come to places like this and speak, uh, and speak my, my ideas. Yeah, yes. what I want. Yeah. And also, Lisa, it's about time that society understands that when we talk about these changes in society, please don't do it for the few of us asking. Do it for yourself. Do yeah. it for society. Do it to know that you are doing the right thing. It's not a favor people are doing, anybody True. asking for equal rights. Yeah, the simple thing is that um, 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 since last election, our parliament became more diverse than it was before. Yes. That's a good thing. Fire but, uh, burning in parliament these days. Sorry? Fire burning in parliament Yeah, these you're days. right, you're yes. right. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good thing. And, and the reason that's good uh, is very simple. And the, the same thing counts for uh, for. Uh, uh, companies and organizations, I guess, uh, the challenges we are facing as a society and the challenge, challenges that a government and politicians uh, well, need to fix, uh, uh, those are complex challenges. 
multifaceted challenges that aren't easy to solve, because if they were easy, we would have solved them already. Um, and to solve a complex problem, you need a lot of different viewpoints. And if you need a lot of different viewpoints, you need to uh, collect Diversify. a group of people with different backgrounds. Yes. It's as simple as that. So that's, that's the whole ratio, and that doesn't... Uh, uh, account for the minority groups. It, it's it's uh, it's for all of us. It's for all of us. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Lisa. You've been very candid and very open, as I know you always are. And um, just go go back to the Hague and do ICT stuff <laughs> the rest of the of this month. Oh, the month is almost done. Thank you so very much, Lisa van Gieneke. You're welcome. <laughs> So up next is um, our second panel, and that will look at the organizational priorities in light of the massive changes that the workplace is currently going through. Uh, I will be talking with representatives from the, uh, the healthcare profession, the private sector, and a governmental ministry. And they are, please join me here on stage, I don't know where you are, Martine de Vries, who is a professor, a professor of medical ethics and health law at Leiden University. Uh, Javier Leonor, who is the Global Inclusion and Diversity Person at Accenture. Yes, please come this way, people. And last but certainly not least, Gera Schneller, who is the Coordinator Diversity and Inclusion at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in the Netherlands. Javier, please have a seat there. Thank you so much. Uh, and there goes Gera. Welcome, everybody. How's everybody doing? Yes, let's just kindly ask you to give a 30 second, no more, 30 second rundown of yourselves and to tell us how the current social changes impact the organizations where you live. Let me start with you, Martina. Wow, 30 seconds. Yes, okay. 30. It so, can be um, done. Um, I'm a, a pediatrician, pediatric endocrinologist treating uh, children with gender dysphoria in Leiden University Medical Center. Most of my time, actually, I'm a medical ethicist now. Um, so, and the, the impact of COVID, well, the, the, as we all know, and Lisa has already uh, told us, I think it had fundamental impact on uh, various uh, values in healthcare. And es especially, well, the, the core values of proximity, uh, presence with healthcare professions being fully with masks and gowns and, and gloves. Uh, not being able to see your loved ones yes. when you're in hospital. So very fundamental values uh, were impacted uh, and that touched upon anyone in healthcare. We'll get, we'll get to that. Your 30 seconds are up for okay. now. No, you're doing great though. Javier, same question to you in 30 seconds. The impact. Impact I of total all the changes in society going on at the moment. I think to be honest, um, Negative and positive, both. I think I'm really um, very much uh, uh, in favor of all the things that have been happening because of Hungary and the reaction of everyone against Hungary. So I think that's, that's kind of something that, that I would like to highlight. Mm -hmm. If we look at COVID, I think we have all been isolated and, and we have been actually looking for human contact. And I think this is the first time for a year and a half that I'm with, with colleagues people. and work, so I'm Gay so happy people. to be here. Yes. So that's... Uh, that's, that's, yeah. that's the thing, yes. Gera, how about you? Yes, well, thank you. 30 seconds. Well, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, we work on LGBTIQ plus rights in two aspects, both externally and inter uh, internally. And externally, of course, as part of our human rights agenda worldwide, well, I don't have to explain to this audience that a lot is happening in that regard. Um, we'll be focusing on what is happening and what that means, mm -hmm. but of course, Every day, you know, we, we face the challenges, our colleagues face the challenges, um, and we have to meet them head on. Yes, true, true. So thanks for that. That wasn't so hard, was it? 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, Martina, you were, you were touching on the, the, the healthcare profession and the, and the COVID situation and how that um, really impacted many people in that sector. Um, but can you tell us about any specific challenges that you see for the LGBTIQ plus community when it comes to COVID and uh, the pandemic and all of that? Well, I, I've really thought about it, but I think it's difficult to really focus on, uh, on that group because what we've seen with COVID is that it impacted uh, 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 many groups um, uh, in, in a, in a uh, very different way. So there are, you know, the, the young, healthy, uh, socioeconomically well people that had nothing to fear. 
um, and other groups. So the, depending on race, socioeconomic status, uh, gender, of course, men more than women, uh, age, were disproportionately in, uh, affected, affected by uh, COVID. So. What we've and and that goes across also the LGBTIQ community, of course, mm -hmm. all these differences. So, um, so what if if I look at it from a positive way? What we've really seen is is that uh, we really need to focus more on specific groups and their healthcare needs. So during COVID, there were certain groups, but. Uh, uh, always we see, uh, but we, we, well, you know, we know, but we don't always see um, that the LGBTIQ community has uh, special needs in healthcare. Yes. So f for me, it's, it's uh, um, with the energy that's now going on to, to look at specific groups and give them the attention they need, mm. it's, it's also a way. Uh, to focus on that again. Yes. So, yeah. so that's a good thing. We should, we could say. I, I think it is. Um, uh, on the other hand, as Lisa has also been mentioning, um, uh, especially for the uh, transgender people on long waiting lists, uh, people with uh, psychological problems who are also facing extreme waiting lists. It's a very difficult time. Um, right now, yes. uh, and and we know that in the LGBTIQ community, uh, th these especially uh, psychological issues are very important and need to be addressed. And 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 very urgently so because uh, yeah. this uh, this is what we're going through now on a global uh, uh, um, uh, level. It's the first time. It's not going to be the last. We're going to have to. It's deal not with going stuff to like be this. the last, and yes. and and as was also uh, mentioned, so so we know there is this psychological burden, mm. uh, which is intensified uh, due to not having contact, not not being able to socialize, um, um, meet people, um, have role models mm -hmm. uh, present or whatever. So, so I think it's a, a major issue that yes. needs to be addressed. I yeah, do. yeah. Uh, Javier, uh, it's, it's been mentioned a couple of times that especially in the LGBTIQ uh, community, there's been a lot of loneliness this past year. And I'm sure that um, your organization, Accenture, uh, found it a little easier than some others to, to, to make the switch to hybrid uh, homework, whatever it is that we're doing these days. Um, do, do you see any unique challenges yourself that the community we're talking about today are facing due to this pandemic, apart from the loneliness and, and yeah. the waiting lists? Yeah, I think that, that we were, as you said, we were lucky because we were already working from home. I've been working from home the last five, six years, so for me it was actually nothing new. Mm -hmm. But I think for some other colleagues who were going to the office or going to clients, then they, all of a sudden they have to do everything from home. And that's, again, loneliness. I think mental health is something that we have been focusing on. So we wanted to make sure that we had programs, and we had them already, but we want to increase them. And now we have so, all kinds of apps that you can use for a personal mental health plan and try to improve yourself if you are into apps. If, if not, we already have other things as well. But I think that uh, to, to have a bit of a positive note on, on, um, on the pandemic, I have lots of colleagues who have actually uh, flourished during the pandemic. Flourished yes. even, not, even just, not just gotten by, but flourished. And even transgender people. Why? Because Many they suddenly didn't have to work with those colleagues they really don't like. <laughs> Maybe, could be. <laughs> I think one of the things that, that we saw is actually that um, uh, for transgender people who are in the transition, by for, uh, or, or for example, um, they don't have the pressure to go to the office every day and ah. choose what they wear and how they look. Yeah. So actually being able to, I want to say, hide or maybe be more discreet just with a small camera, that has given many people the options uh, to, 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 to find who they are and then present to the world six months later. Yes. So I think uh, that's one thing. Also, we have situations with colleagues who actually came out to their family and they, they, they didn't accept it. And I'm talking about Western Europe, not about difficult countries, but just, you know, UK, for example. And, um, and they had, you know, to live with their parents, not accepting them for the, you know, for the months of the pandemic. So that's a bit of a difficult situation. But I think um, there's plus and minuses, and I think we have, to, uh, we have to live with both. Yes, quite interesting, really, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Gera, uh, all of those societal changes that we've been talking about for this past year, and there's been quite a lot, I mean, oh, yes. um, <laughs> They, they really do not respect any borders, those, those, those changes. So within the Netherlands Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, 
What have been the major challenges that you have seen uh, regarding the LGBTIQ plus inclusion in societies where you work around the world? Yes, well, of course, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is works at an international stage, but we are also an international organization mm -hmm. working in, in many different countries, over 100. And um, I do recognize a lot of what my fellow uh, panelists are saying, is that it has been a very mixed bag. Internationally, you see um, developments that are contrary in some countries. We have seen that really communities and uh, nations have stepped up and uh, LGBTIQ rights have actually been at the forefront. There mm -hmm. have been an improvement also in the legal environment. But unfortunately, we've seen other communities often driven at the highest political level where the uncertainty um, that is found within society um, is channeled towards hatred of certain groups. And unfortunately, the LGBTI plus community has been a focus in, in a number of countries. Um, for the Dutch human rights agenda, you know, that's one of the pillars of our foreign policy. Uh, within that, the LGBTIQ plus rights mm -hmm. are a priority. Um, the Netherlands are one of the founding members of the Equal Rights Coalition. And so, you know, we have to step up our efforts to counter these negative developments everywhere in the world. How do you do but that? Well, I think one of the things, of course, we speak out. We work with the uh, uh, organizations within the countries themselves, talking to them, seeing how we can support them, because it has to be led from within. Um, of course, you know, we have uh, seen our Minister of Foreign Affairs and also our Prime Minister in the last few days speak out very clearly I about the development. I was going to ask you, is that what you're yes. looking for? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but also it has had quite a profound influence on our organisation. How? Well, the interesting thing is, because we have been at the forefront of this fight for such a long time, um, you know, when we look at our own organisation, sometimes it's a challenge to explain to you know, to realize for ourselves and to explain to our colleagues that this is also still an issue for us, for the Netherlands as a country, but also for us as an organization, because you tend to sort of grade on the curve. Um, for four years, I was the ambassador to Zimbabwe. Well, I'm sure that everyone knows the feelings of the former president Mugabe yes. towards LGBTIQ people. Um, when you hear that every day, when you live in a country like that, and you see what that does to LGBTIQ people in the country, you start to think, oh, well, thank goodness, I'm from the Netherlands, everything's okay. But it's, it's not. not. <laughs> you know, uh, Lisa van Ginnik already mentioned that. And um, it makes it harder to explain that we still have a lot of steps to take within our country and within our own organization to make sure that LGBTIQ people do not face obstacles within their career, within their life at the, the uh, organization, and within their inclusion. Yes, but part of it, that, part of that, what you're saying now is complacency. Yes. And uh, yes. I'm sorry to say the Dutch are really good at being complacent and congratulating themselves on how, <laughs> how, how well, no, I have to be honest here, yeah. on how well we do stuff, but we don't. So this, this is a mindset change. How, how would you go about Absolutely. that on yes. your level? Yes. Well, I think one of the most important things is leadership from the top. Um, in, within our organization, we have an integrated diversity and inclusion policy. And specifically with regard to the LGBTI uh, colleagues, we are moving from giving clarity about what is difficult, mm -hmm. going towards what can we do to take away obstacles and to make sure that there is true equity and there is true inclusion. And this process is really being led from the top and we're working together with, for instance, we have a very active uh, LGBTIQ network. They're called Out There. I hope they're watching. Hi, Out There. <laughs> and um, if you work, we have to really work together and keep on spreading the word. And in that sense, um, Yes, COVID has been very difficult because outreach activities have become more difficult within the organization. On the other hand, like I said, we are an international organization with a lot of satellite organizations everywhere in the world. And because many of the things that we're doing went online, we could actually integrate people from far away much easier. And for instance, we have unconscious bias training. 
that used to be in a classroom at our ministry in The Hague. Mm. Now it is online, and people from all over the world can join, and they can become part of this movement. And you're getting different input than you used absolutely. to in your little classroom. Absolutely, yes. yes. So that's interesting as yeah. well. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing tiny little blessings left and right mm. of this, this, this crisis that we have been in. Yes, Javier. Just to go on, on the topic that you were saying, I think for us it was the same. Last year we had all prepared to celebrate Pride season, as we call it, because it's not just a month, it's a season, I think. Yeah. Um, and everything had to go online. And actually, we would have some learning moments, we will have some education uh, training things, we will have some social things as well. And the funny thing is, because everything went online, we had colleagues from Singapore joining events hosted in New York. Exactly. And we had someone from South Africa joining something in Stockholm. And that gives and you that different is something perspectives. That this, the feeling of family, which I think is what we want to create, I think it was mentioned by Rodney, the policies are great, but actually the culture is what happens at the coffee, um, at the coffee machine or at the printer or at the, when you have lunch. That's when actually inclusion can show or not show, um, I think that, that really increased. So actually the family, if I can say it like that, of LGBT uh, employees and all, all, all the minorities as well in Accenture oh. is now much more together than before. It's a yes. bit of a crazy thing because everyone's suffering, we, we all have been affected, but for the inclusion part, not for the representation, for the inclusion part, I think it has been actually good. Yes. I know I, I, it sounds horrible I, I, to say, but... Uh, let, let's, let's say it's really softly, but I tend to agree with you. <laughs> What about the other societal changes that we've seen this past year? Me Too, Black Lives Matter, that must have had an impact on all of you, Javier. Uh, yes, um, what we did as well last year when Black Lives Matter happened and George Floyd, actually we, we changed all our messages to make sure that we were making references, not only to Pride, but also to, uh, to um, Black Lives Matter. So actually what we see is that by joining forces with any other, we don't call them minorities in Argentina, we call them underrepresented groups. Oh, that's a way that, better way of calling that it. That sounds a bit yes. better, a bit more you know, politically correct, I think. Um, so we become stronger because actually when you do an event with the African-American community, with the Hispanic-American community, with the mental health community, then actually you reach both your LGBT audience and the mental health audience. So actually, um, I think that we have realized that, that by doing things together, we advance faster. Mm -hmm. So Accenture is now the, 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 the great example of intersectionality, no? We, we, I mean, we are on our way, but we are far from perfect. Okay. There's many things we still have to learn and to do and make mistakes. At least so. you know. Many don't. We're yes. trying, we're trying. Right. <laughs> How does that work for you at, at well, the Well, you know, it, um, it's, it's exactly the same. What we've seen is that, uh, of course, because we're an academic hospital, we also do teaching. Uh, of students to become doctors, medical specialists. And we had to completely change our curriculum because it all had to go online. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also had the advantage that we could invite people from everywhere in the world to join uh, our education. So that was really great. And, and with the um, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, the, at least the, the, from, from our Pride Network, we also try to say, okay, so we have to rewrite also medical history. Medical history is really uh, white male focused. It is, um, and as a small black woman, I notice it whenever somebody administers medication to me. Yeah. The doses are way too high for me. Go on. So, yes. so uh, and with the uh, decolonization of the medical curriculum, because that's what we really are uh, uh, doing now, and which is really uh, great and impressive, also to see, it's also in a negative sense impressive to see how white male focused medicine always has been. But we also introduced uh, the LGBTQ. Uh, history mm -hmm. into it because th th there are also a lot of uh, well you, you cannot really call it mistakes but the way things are written down uh, transgender people are uh, th th so there are a lot of transgender people in medical history for example but they're th they're always uh, seen as uh, females who act like males because then in society they are accepted better yes. for example yes so which is a completely frustrating b because th that's not what really happened if you look at their histories um, so we are rewriting th the medical curriculum and th and also that's uh, uh, within intersectionality because you know if you do it together uh, you have so much more uh, power 
So, so when, when will the next generation be profiting from what you are writing now? When will it be ready? That's what I'm asking. Well, I think, so, so we, we started rewriting the, uh, last year, the first year. So in, in four years, you will have a medical doctor, uh, which is uh, completely trained in a different way. And I'll so. still be around, so that's good. <laughs> yes. If they're trained in Leiden, of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like exactly. Yes. Only in Leiden. Only no, in Leiden. no, no. I, I, I really don't hope so. But uh. what? Um, let me start with you again, uh, uh, Martina. I'm going to ask all of you. What would be the main pointer that you give to organizations at this crossroads? How 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 can you help them move forward? Um. Well, I've, I've been thinking about that, and, and, and I would just give a very, very uh, small advice. And that is now, so as of this Monday in the Netherlands, for example, you can go to your office for 50%. And that will, is really going to be awkward. Not, not in the healthcare profession, because we've always been going to the hospital, of course. But for many people, it's the first time they were, are going to come to the office. And I would really say, uh, as... as um, uh, for organizations just give room for reconnection as if these people are for the first time in the office also to give room to open up in, in various ways n n not only in coming out or whatever but mm -hmm. also in, in the, uh, other ways uh, private things you're facing um, and of course the leadership has to give the example um, but to uh, to really m make it uh, a reconnection period. So use this moment to, to to become warmer, more inclusive, uh, more welcoming. Yeah, to because all. It, well, at least in, in in my hospital, I know there are still many uh, healthcare uh, professionals who uh, didn't uh, uh, have have their coming out be because they didn't dare to in this. In the in this structure of becoming a medical doctor and um, yes, we've heard and, about that today a and, lot. Mm -hmm. And that would be uh, uh, a great way, you know, if, if for reconnection and to sort of start over again. Yeah. Because if you know, if if you've already been working for two years, it's it's getting more and more difficult to speak out. Uh, but if we can say, okay, we're just starting over again. Sounds like so, sounds like a great plan. Thank you, Martina. How about you, Javier? I think it's a bit pretentious to give uh, one piece of advice, but I'll try. I think that it was mentioned already by Rodney. I think what gets measured gets managed. So, maintenance is waiting uh, for the Dutch speakers. I think that whatever you don't measure, if we don't know how many women we have, how many non-binary, how many LGBT people, how many people of color, how many people with disabilities, then you don't know if you're on the, on the right track. So, I think we can have, as mentioned already, the best policies in the world and everything should be super inclusive on your PDF. Uh, portal, but I think that the numbers in your company are, is actually what's telling the story, is walking the walk uh, that we were saying. So I think if you don't know the numbers in your company, find a way, always respecting the law, obviously, because we have to respect privacy, but there are ways to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, measuring how you're doing inclusion, not only for LGBT, but for every group, yeah. I think that's the message I would give to everyone. And, and that's what you're actually going to be doing? Uh, we do, you we do, do it already. already. We do already. Okay, so. wonderful. Gera, how about you? Yes, I think if I can give two pieces of advice, but they're in the same okay. area. One is um, put diversity and inclusion at the forefront of what you're doing. Don't make it an afterthought or a check mark. It is really should be part of everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And the second, what I would like to mention is stop treating diversity as a zero sum game. As uh, a what? A zero sum game. Yes. Um, I find that a lot of people, they have this idea, oh, if we do more for this underrepresented group, then we don't need the other them. ones are left behind. How can we do this? Actually, um, if you work on diversity and inclusion, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, actually. It a becomes a multiplier effect. Yeah. If you become, as a company or an organization, more diverse and more inclusive, it will attract more diverse talent. And so it will help your company actually move ahead, your organization. And so I always find it very... It, it's not helpful in so many ways. If we think in boxes, mm -hmm. and if we put people in boxes, let's look at the picture all together, and it needs to be... Um, you know, people talk about melting pot. I hate that. It needs to be a salad bowl where all the flavors 
can be individually tasted and are beautiful together. Yes. Yes. So I think that is something that we really have to work on. Wonderful. So thank you. I'm going to move to Mike, uh, Mike on the mic, and see how the chat is going for this panel. Mike, it's tell going me very it's, well. Yeah. Um, we had a question similar to Lisa, but uh, this time it's aimed at, uh, at Martine and the panel, of course. Uh, trans healthcare was heavily impacted by COVID-19 and already underfunded and monopolized by a few hospitals. Um, have either VUMC or UMCG or other clinics reached out to you or vice versa? Martin. Um, yeah, well, there, there, and actually, there has been a lot of uh, discussion, uh, especially uh, well, for, for me as an ethicist and a, a pediatrician, uh, for the healthcare of the, the, uh, the young transgender uh, people. And there's a lot going on in in uh, getting rid of the waiting lists um, uh, and having more the centers involved in uh, uh, treatment. So I, I really think it's, it's, it's on the right track. Um, people, the, the, the problem is also that, that healthcare professionals are hesitant, uh, especially to treat very young uh, people, because internationally there's been a lot of discussion. And that's not, that's not, uh, help, it's not helpful, really not helpful. So, so the recent uh, verdict in England that uh, uh, people under the age of 16 cannot be treated, um, it's, it's really not helpful. And we're really fighting uh, again also as a country uh, because the, also the most medical uh, research is done in the Netherlands uh, and mental health uh, research. Um, so I think it's going in the right direction, finally. Good, thanks. Mike. Another question, uh, this time it's specifically to, to Javier. Um, you work closely with the Russian LGBTQ plus community at Accenture. Uh, what tips or success stories can you share with the audience on how to make workplaces safe in Russia, especially in companies that are still, uh, still do not have such communities? They don't have those communities built yet. Well, I, I, th I think you're thinking of the question. I think in, in those difficult countries, and Russia is one of them, uh, you can only uh, get things done if you work together. And there we work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in your embassy, in, where we hosted a round table with other companies that are present here today as well. And that was kind of the, the spark that started the community business building for, for Russia. And I think they still have you know, regular meetings every so often. So I think I would say call the embassy. <laughs> And, uh, and try to get some support from other companies around you, because on your own you will not achieve much. You're talking about diplomacy, but I'm wondering if, if, we, should, if we should just use the big uh, uh, um, global companies to, to put pressure on countries where things need to change. No, we do. The only thing is, for example, that round table, um, we were a bit uncertain, and I think uh, World Press was a part of that. Can we host it? Can we not host it? Are we breaking the law? I mean, the law is always a bit difficult to to interpret, and actually the ministry was so kind to offer the, the embassy ground, which is Dutch ground, I believe. Yes. So basically there was, we were kind of, phew, it's, it's possible we can do it. So I think working together with, with other companies and with, with the local, I mean, Sweden is also very active, the Netherlands, so I think those, those countries are doing wonderful things for, for those people in those difficult countries as well. Aye. Questions from the audience time, I think. Yeah, if you have any, or you got, you got. Well, questions from this audience. From this audience. Yes. Start raising your hands so, Mike can come with I'll, the mic. I'll don the mask. Yeah. He yes, it. Mike is really conscientious about this, and we appreciate that so much. Start raising your hands if you have Anybody any questions. Mask, right over there. Oh, on You're the going right. to have to walk a while. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my, my question is actually for Hera. Um, uh, one thing that, that we've noticed in our work at, at HIVOS is that um, due to COVID-19, a lot of people who've, um, who've already ha had a hard time in the workplace, like LGBTIQ plus people, have lost their jobs, uh, have lost their livelihoods, and then um, weren't reached by humanitarian relief, aren't reached by economic development, um, uh, redevelopment after the, the, the worst of the crisis is over. So um, how can the Ministry of Foreign Affairs be a little bit more intentional about mainstreaming the needs of LGBTIQ plus people th throughout more than just the human rights agenda? Yeah. Oh. Interesting. Yes, I, that's a very valid point. Um, indeed, of course, with you know, the economic collapse in many countries due to COVID-19, uh, companies have closed and people that are you know, uh, depending on, for instance, day labor 
uh, they have found themselves in a very difficult position. And you know, once the rehiring starts, it's harder if you're part of a community that is sometimes shunned. Um, it is very difficult for um, uh, aid organizations to reach specific groups, especially when they're not very visible, when they're hidden within society. So for us as Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the organizations that we work with, we really need to know where they are and we have to do a better job in finding them and reaching out. And in many countries we do, we have very strong relationships with the LGBTIQ uh, NGOs. But in others, it is more difficult because they are not as well organized. And they won't come knocking on your door. And they often don't come knocking on our door. So because, how do you yeah. find them? Yes. Well, like I said, in many uh, countries, we do have these, these uh, links with organizations. And if not, we go out and find them. Actively in the streets? Absolutely. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. I didn't know yeah. that. It's part of diplomacy as well. We it don't is, just go to governments. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, where's Mike? Yeah. Um, yes. Right, up there. Stand up, please, so we... And maybe just up the light in the room just a bit so we can see who we're ta talking to. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Emma from America, and I have a question specifically for Martine. Um, how do you work specifically with children identifying as LGBTQ plus um, while still uh, promoting the confidentiality that maybe they're not out to their parents yet um, and utilizing their proper pronouns and not using dead names um, within that specific healthcare setting and particularly also with insurance providers. Thank yeah, you. A, a, a very good question. So f for me, it's it's rather easy. So so I always, uh, when I first meet um, a, a child, I always state my name and also my pronouns. So so I I also already give the room for the other person also to uh, speak out. Um, we just we just um, ha had a completely new uh, child hospital within the uh, LUMC. Um, and, and what I noticed again is that it was really, well, very childish. First of all, I, I, I almost only see adolescents, so for me it was kind of childish. And, it, and there was no way, uh, and, it, and it was really white, you know, also in, in all the advertisements for the new hospital. So um, what I'm now trying to do is um, have it... Um, uh, very simple signs for the LGBTQ community, so uh, rainbow uh, uh, flags. You know, it's just small things when you when you uh, go out to the secretary and make a new appointment, or when you come in, uh, so that it's uh, LGBTQ friendly. Um, I, most of the times I'm wearing something so for, for, for people to also understand that they can talk to me about it. And I often, well, most of the times, at least for half of the appointment, I talk to the child alone. Um, so, and, and that's what I'm also teaching my fellow uh, pediatricians to do. But it's, it's sort of, um, uh, in the pediatric setting, I find it's, it's a sort of difficult because children are really seen as uh, children and, and that this is not part of their, their identity. And for me, it's, it's extremely important because it's, it's just a phase where they explore their identity. So, so for me, it's also a very interesting topic. But you have to t keep on teaching uh, the, the fellow pediatricians uh, to do the same. Because what we see is that very often a lot of uh, physical problems come down to mental problems that are internalized and, and shown as uh, physical problems. Um, so that's, that's the way I do it. But I, I, I can imagine though, Martina, that young people coming to see you, children, uh, who are still exploring, who really don't know uh, where, how they identify and how they would like to be seen or to see themselves. I wonder how a professional goes about that conversation without actually putting words or thoughts mm -hmm. or 
feelings into somebody's head. I, that that, that yeah. to me seems so, to be very so, difficult. So what I uh, find really interesting and what I see with, with uh, and, uh, especially with my students, but also with the adolescents I see, uh, that the, the uh, for example the the uh, non-binary or um, uh, you know n n not uh, defining yourself um, uh, as being attracted to men or women or uh, whatever so 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 that it's um, the fluidity of children is really great to see and and I think it's getting more and more open. Uh, and um, uh, so what, what I see is that, that the talk about this is, is much more easy. Not always, uh, of course, and, and, and of course I'm not pushing it. The, the, for me, it's great that I see people for a very long time because I don't only see um, transgender people, but I, I see all people with mental health problems who also need... Uh, physical care because of their mental health problem, um, and I see them for years and years, and and you get a connection. Um, so you don't need to, you know, address it the first time and say, okay, right. so in what box do you fit? You know, it's <laughs> it's. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think there's room for one more question. I have no idea where Mike is. Mike, there you are. Yes, one more. Um, Maureen from Arcades. Um, I have a question for Gera uh, Sneller. Um, I think in. I see that when we are having, for example, a global event, that there's often the question, like, what can we do for countries where it's going less well? And I think also even from higher, higher levels, people find this a difficult question. So I was wondering, like, what is possible? Uh, I heard Javier's example, but still, like, when do you cross the law? So you mean what, what, what can Gera and her people do globally? Um, yeah, yeah, no, what, in, what can you do within your own company then actually? What can you do within yeah. your own organization, Gera? Yes. Um, you mean within our own organization as in foreign affairs here in the Netherlands? Or you mean in, in the countries where we operate? No, yeah. My, uh, can you maybe, yeah, what are you doing that I can use or what, what I can learn from of implying that as well in my company? Okay, okay. Um, I think f from within our own company, I think the most important thing is um, to have an integrated policy on diversity and inclusion and to make sure that the LGBTIQ colleagues are very visible within that policy. So they are specifically mentioned and not sort of part of swept away like, okay, you're, you're part of it. No, you have to be visible. And the challenges of the LGBTIQ plus community within the organization have to ma be made specific and they have to be specifically addressed. And if you work in an international organization such as the Netherlands, that become, or such as the MFA of the Netherlands, it becomes more broad because we have people working here in The Hague. Then we have Dutch posted staff that go to countries all over the world. Some countries that are more like the Netherlands and some countries where they may face additional uh, issues. Then we have people working in those countries where, um, I mean, people from those countries, citizens from the countries where we operate, who may be LGBTIQ people and who live on a day-to-day -day basis in a society that may not accept them, but they are our colleagues. Mm -hmm. So you, we face, um, and not me personally, but you know, as an organization, and specifically my colleagues in those countries face a different type of challenge than you do when you are in The Hague. And so if you design a policy, you have to address all of those different groups and you can only do that by reaching out and talking to them and letting them uh, steer you towards where they need to go yes thank you thank answer? you i'm afraid that that's all we have time for in this panel so um thank you gira sneller and javier leonor and martine de vries there's one more panel coming up announce the third panel, which will be led by Michiel Kolman. Michiel Kolman being the co-chair of Workplace Pride. And the theme of this third and last panel today is intersectionality, 
a catalyst for change. And Thank you. And I know that you have to run. I do. So this is my happy moment to give you a big bottle of Ooh, pink like champagne a and a big round of applause. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank for you so much, everybody. It was been wonderful seeing actual people again. Okay, so here you go. You yeah, got I hope your you own have sound, right? <laughs> yes. You go. Okay. Thank yes, you. Great. Good Thanks luck. a lot. Bye. So intersectionality, a, a catalyst for change, and I will immediately start introducing the panelists. And uh, so here on my left is Justice Eisfeld. He's program manager at Free to Be Me at uh, HIFOS. He uh, was also founder of the co-chair of Transgender Europe helped to launch Transgender Network Nederland and about to start an executive MBA at Central European University, a program that Workplace Pride is also supporting. We have Yuli Kim, is a DNI specialist, international organizations, especially multicultural ones, founder of Inclusion Sensei, two MBAs, one from the FU and one from Erasmus, now managing the learning and development program at Workplace Pride. And Yuli comes from Japan, but I think your family is originally from Korea, and I'm sure you tell a little bit more about that later. Jeroen Haver, an experienced professional in international business and economic development, now international business manager at NL Business, long career in government, for instance, the Ministry of Infrastructure, uh, the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, and the World Bank in Washington, D.C. So I give all the panelists uh, their own five minutes to have their perspective on the intersectionality. And uh, why don't we start with justice? Um, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, um, <laughs> There's so many things that one could say about intersectionality, and for me, it um, it it always comes down a little bit also to to look at just look at the numbers, look at what we already know. So, so for example, um, the Netherlands is one of the few countries where we actually have quite a lot of data on how LGBTIQ plus people are doing in in their lives how their employment situation is, how, how, they're, um, how happy they are, um, um, et cetera. We, we actually have uh, representative data on that. And, and I think once we, once we start looking at, but what does the data actually tell us? And are we seeing the people we should be seeing? Are, are we centering the people we should be centering? And very often, that's not the case. You know, we, we know that intersex people have the worst time at, at f having and finding jobs. Hmm. But UVFA does not have a program to help intersex people gain employment. Um, we know that, that trans people um, are often faced with bullying in, in schools and therefore ha are less likely to have a diploma, are less likely to have the, the level of education that they should be having. But um, uh, we're often not focusing on that in, in our employment uh, um, processes. So for example, um, you mentioned Free to Be Me, which is, which is our new program to support LGBTIQ plus economic development in 14 countries. Um, and I'm, I'm currently hiring staff um, in, uh, in, uh, for this program in, in around the world. And um, we were quite intentional, for example, in how we uh, worded our job descriptions. Um, in the past, we would have said, um, needs to have um, um, uh, an academic degree um, for this position. And that excluded a whole load of people who were perfectly fit to, um, to be a grants manager, to be, a, uh, to be a, a, a project officer, who had the experience, who had the, the connections to the communities, who had the level of think, the abstract level of thinking that, that is sometimes required, um, but who didn't have that piece of paper for all the, those reasons. So we changed that, and, and we changed that to, um, uh, to be more inclusive and, and be um, uh, an employer that can actually hire trans people because they fit within our job descriptions. Mm. And, and, and uh, we had at least one case where, um, where, we, ha where we will be hiring somebody who, who, f who has what it takes to, to do the job, um, but is currently pursuing a, de uh, a degree and, and has been for a while and, 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 and will help them to, to get there. So um, 
so when, when, when you want to be um, intentional about intersectionality in, in your business, um, it's important to, to look beyond just the obvious. You know, the, for trans people, the obvious uh, being that, that identity documents, uh, that your, your key pass to enter the office uh, has the correct name and pronoun, that, that it's easy to update your email address when you change your name, that um, uh, uh, you only use legal names when, when you need to and, and use um, the uh, social names when, 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 wherever you can, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ensure that transition processes run smoothly, that HR has a, has a playbook. Um, but you, ha you, you also have to look deeper, and you have mm. to look deeper at how can we uh, be a good employer for, um, uh, for people who should and would fit in our company, but um, are maybe not fitting the mold that, we, that we've had for so long. And how do you go about this as, as employer? Well, as, as I said, one, one way is to, uh, um, to look more at um, what are the, uh, the competencies that somebody has to have, what are, what are the skills, what, what kind of personality are we looking for in this position, and, and start from there um, rather than, than just looking at a CV. Um, and he was as, a, as an organization that's, that's also in the process of changing our hiring mm. uh, processes. But I've seen, um, I've seen others um, who, who, start, um, um, uh, who start the hiring process by, by looking at, um, um, at skills rather than a, than a CV, um, who start with very different questions um, and very different um, uh, job descriptions to to be able to attract a pool of people um, who who would otherwise maybe be put off by um, by your regular description, but who would flourish in a, yeah. in a welcoming environment. I find it very refreshing, and I think I think, oh my God, the way we hire at Elsevier is maybe a little bit conservative, and <laughs> on Monday I'm going to change that. <laughs> so that's already a good learning moment. So thanks, Justice. Let's move on. So, Julie, so your perspective on the intersectionality. Yeah, I think I want to talk about intersectionality in the context of LGBTIQ+. Um, as you can see, I'm Asian. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but I'm lesbian. I have a rainbow family yes. and coming from Japan. But those are uh, sort of visible characteristics of, of mine. And intersectionality refers to um, the framework, how your different personal characteristics impact how you're treated in the society. And believe it or not, I'm also an immigrant here, uh, but I'm still a privileged kind of position. I feel I'm privileged still. Um, in the sense that with my education, socioeconomic background, etc. So those are the visible characteristics, characteristics uh, of mine. And when I think about intersectionality in the context of LGBTIQ+, I had this opportunity to give a talk about intersectionality uh, at the, one of the member uh, organizations of Workplace Pride Amsterdam. And uh, so my question was, how do you identify yourself? And the options were LGBTIQ+. Mm. And I excluded straight because I was giving a talk within the uh, uh, LGBTIQ plus ERGs. Yeah. So maybe there might have, might have been some straight allies there. And I was thinking um, the majority would choose gay because yeah. that has been the case within a lot of talks. And my dis uh, discourse was, see, the gay men still dominate the, the group, thus we need to work to work on underrepresented people within the community. Mm. To my surprise, the highest score was the other. Ah, okay. The other. So that meaning probably not some straight allies, but non-binary people or who don't identify LGBTIQ+, and many more. So, um, when I think about intersectionality in the context of LGBTIQ+, we need to talk about, we, we, maybe we, we need to stop othering us. Mm -mm. Maybe invite straight allies, invite others to talk about um, how LGBTIQ plus inclusion is beneficial for beyond LGBTIQ plus people. 
And another thing that I wanted to mention was the um, generational lens. For example, the word queer. Yes. And if you ask a baby boomer the word queer, they might, their experience has not been entirely positive mm. with the word queer. But when you ask teenager or 20 plus, they would use it proudly. So the society, it, it's not that people are suddenly turning queer, right? I think the society, is, it is allowing us, us and people to be who they are and just express who, who, how they feel inside. And I think it's time to apply different lens when, it, when, when we look at intersectionality, not just LGBTQ plus lens, but uh, generation mm -hmm. and perhaps race, mm -hmm. culture, language, and many more invisible characteristics. So that's, my, that's what I think. I do like the point that you brought up, your, your expectation that most people will be gay in your audience. Um, because that, yeah, you see that often in ERGs, uh, the majority of the members are, are, are gay, um, and often they're white gay men. And does it mean that there's a special kind of extra expectation on them? Because you know, you know, they, their, their roles are a little bit easier than people who are, are kind of forced to have different identities at the same time. Is there almost to talk about a privilege there, which they should then actually use so that others will benefit? I think even within the LGBTIQ plus community, when I use the word privilege yes. to the white gay men, yes. they get kind of disengaged from the conversation. Uh -huh. So I would say stop blaming white men. <laughs> We're all in this together, yes. and we should all take a part in improving the situation. And perhaps uh, white gay men are in a slightly more powerful, powerful position. But if you turn your privilege to, for, to help the others, mm. it becomes superpower, exactly. right? So that's how I encourage uh, in our learning development program, uh, instead of saying, uh, calling privilege of pri privileges, mm -hmm. when I use superpower, people want to use it. What's my superpower? Tell yes. me, tell me. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of say, uh, saying straight privilege, straight superpower, cisgender superpower, heterosexual superpower, and they understand, oh my goodness, yeah, I breathe this like air mm -hmm. entire life, but some people don't have access to those um, superpower. I want to use it and t so that I can make s something better for other people, so. I like the very powerful metaphor. Great, thank you. I move on to uh, Jeroen, so maybe your five minutes perspective. <laughs> Um, well, thanks very much. Um, as you said, yeah, I've worked for over 25 years in the international arena, uh, business, government, uh, large corporations alike, and I've also traveled a lot around the world. And so I've come ac across intersectionality in many aspects, also personally, both positive and, and negatively. Um, but one thing that I kind of found out is that it's always how you are being perceived, right? Mm. So we have these many aspects, as Yuli also just said, um, and it's up to us kind of which aspects we may want to emphasize each moment. And I think given the situation or the uh, circumstances you're in, you, you kind of want to choose between that. And, um, you know, for instance, when I traveled uh, to countries like Kenya or Kazakhstan or indeed Africa or where, for instance, being gay is not the norm or even officially not allowed. Mm. Um, you have to fill out all sorts of forms about everything before you get your uh, visa and so on. So th then your question, you know, do I say the truth? So yeah, I could maybe take the, you know, the choice like, okay, yeah, I fill out and I'm married to, to my husband, etc. But that could put me in a dangerous situation, mm. but also later on could put my husband in a dangerous situation when he would travel there, whether personally or in business or, or so on. Um, so that's something that, that you always have to be, I think, uh, confronted with. But secondly, actually in business, in many parts of the world, um, already Latin America, Africa, Asia, trust, building trust is the first thing that people do before you come to business. Mm. Um, and we come to business very quickly, right? Okay, you like this, okay, yeah, we have a deal, okay, and I trust you till uh, proven the wrong way. There it's the opposite. Building a trust relationship takes maybe about a year or longer, and they really want to know all about you. Mm. 
Yeah. They want to get to know you. They want to get to know your family. Now, so how do you go about that when you know maybe for them it's not the norm or you could maybe, yeah, it could be very confrontational if you start saying, oh, I'm gay, lesbian, queer. I, and I don't mean to say that you shouldn't, but you could choose the moment when you do want to say that message or uh, emphasize that point. And maybe it's not at the very beginning because it could be, you know, for them also hard to yeah. respond. A matter of timing, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a... So we have all these many aspects. And, yeah, I, th I think... Um, so, you, you know, I read about the intersectionality. Well, the, the, there were, I think, 12, 14 or 15 different aspects, right? Yes. We all have sections. Um, and it means, actually, that I think if you do the math, that, that, that probably everyone is is unique. Mm. No one has a, the exact same combination of all those 14 traits. If we, you know, you come up to about six, seven billion, the number of, uh, of that, and there's about seven billion people in the world. So basically, I think each one of us is unique, but we're all human, right? We're all the same. So I think you can be treated equally, but still respecting everyone's intersectionality, everyone's differences, the way they also would like to. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm looking at Mike. <laughs> if there are already questions coming in in the chat. There are questions. I don't think, oh, my mic's on. Yeah. Um, first question is, uh, how can we educate uh, previous generations more and deeper at a, a deeper level and at the same time be polite to earlier generations, let's say? Ah, the generational question. Yes. Anybody wants to take that one? I see Justice thinking fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that fast of a thinker. <laughs> um, you know, I, th I, I think um, with generations, there's, there's sometimes a, um, a language difference and sometimes an attitude difference, and, and, and often those get confused. Mm. Um, uh, and I think um, all generations have to have to learn to to look beyond the words and look at look at what people are actually trying to say or do, um, and 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 work from um, from the premise that that most people have good intentions, um, and and most people try to be good people and 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 try to. Um, um, be friendly to other people, and 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 you know once once we start working from that premise, um, I think the uh, um, what could have been a conflict um, s sort of changes into into a shared road that we maybe come from different um, um, uh, smaller roads. Great, um, thank you, Yuli. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Uh, good question also. So um, Ipsos Mori's report from 2017 says in the UK, uh, this is about baby boomers report. Yes. Uh, um, sorry, the um, Gen Z report. Yeah. And in that report it says... We're now just entering the workforce, right? Yeah, yeah. so 34% of the Gen Zers in the UK are not exclusively heterosexual. Which is an incredibly high number. A high number. Yeah. And when you compare that number from baby boomer to uh, uh, Gen X and millennials, it's, it goes like this. So the more yeah. and more yeah. people are yeah. saying, well, I may not be straight. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm okay with that idea. And like I said, it's not that people are suddenly turning queer or gay or lesbian mm -hmm. or bisexual. Um, they're comfortable to express how they feel. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know how to say that in a polite way for the <laughs> older generation, but the, I think the older generation needs to kind of do the reality check. This is, this is what's happening now versus mm -hmm. what you think it is. There's a huge gap between the employee, employers and em, future employees. So yes. it's, it's so important to fill that gap to understand that younger generation. Otherwise, you miss the opportunity to hire the top talent from the market, job market. Uh, regardless of their gender identity or sexual mm -hmm. orientation. So, um, and what would you do as, as an employer? So how, 
How can you be more attractive to there are many Generation things. Z. Yeah, there are many things that they can do, and one of the things that they can apply is probably the. Um, um, oh, that slipped that word. Uh, the, the reverse mentoring. Ah, yeah. So Excellent. rather than uh, seasoned professionals mentoring mm -hmm. the younger professional, just flip the yes. yeah the uh, mentor mentee oh, position. Bottom up and, uh, knowledge. Yeah, there's uh, just. Yeah. Just ask, what's going on? What yeah. do I not understand? What do I not see? And there's so much that the younger generation can tell you because they're the future. And a lot of uh, the Gen Zers are more uh, proactive in expressing and acting on uh, anti-buying certain products mm. or using certain services. And they're really quick compared to millennials. Milli millennials are about hashtag, don't buy this. <laughs> so when it, whereas Gen Zers, well, I'm not going to buy it. Don't buy it yes. and stop. Mm -hmm. So yes. a very active generation. So there's, um, it's really critical business impairment, uh, imperative for business leaders to understand what's, what younger generation wants. Great. Mike, one final question, because it, it's going super fast, I feel. It is uh, indeed. Um, I'd like to have the panel talk about intersectionality and how it intersects itself with digital human rights, where uh -huh. we are with that as COVID has made everybody a lot more online these days and immersed in the online world. Where does that juxtapose with, uh, with that? This time, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I think fast on this one. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to see if I fully understand the question. So yeah, I, I think well, in, in this di digital uh, time that we're all living in, again, w when it's about work and, 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 and you know, you can only, through a small computer screen, yeah. you can only show so much of yourself, right? We, and naturally, we're then all focused on that face, that, that, that this small part, yeah. uh, and maybe your voice. And I think that, that that can be then very confrontational, I think, or to some people, maybe elder generation, or who, if they get confronted with some, you know, some visual image that they, they're not, used to because it's not very common for them. So I think that's also for the other person also to understand. So, you know, not everyone may fully understand what you are expressing. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that, that I think both sides kind of need to be aware. And again, here you also have the choice, like, or not always the choice, but maybe, you know, how do I go about this? How, what do I show at which moment in time? Uh, particularly if it's about work and you want to be respected if you, or if you have to make a business deal, it could really, that could be just one thing that, you know, throws it out. And then you could say, hey, I'm, I'm hurt and this is discrimination, this is wrong, but you still wanted to make the business deal. Mm. Um, and maybe that person would have accepted it if it was brought at a different time, different way, whatever. So I think it's always culture is... You know, it's, it's two-way street and, and it's give and take and people need to understand one another. Uh, but it is difficult in a digital uh, time. Yeah. And I think particularly for trans people or, yeah, yeah, very much so. One final burning question. No, we don't have time. I can give some feedback from the audience yes, uh, online, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, superpowers and advantages terms uh, seem to be less polarizing, is what the audience is saying. Yeah, excellent. And um, one person says that they would like to kind of incorporate this superpower idea into their, uh, their workflow with inclusivity. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, then let me thank the panel. I mean, have you join me for an applause? And then I give the floor to <laughs> our executive director, David Pollard, who is there. All right. Thank you very much to everybody. Well, it's been uh, three hours long. I'd like to particularly thank the audience here in the, in the auditorium for sitting this long, but I think it's been fascinating myself. I've learned so much. Every time you learn so much more about uh, inclusion, about listening, and about the fact that we're actually at a crossroads. So Workplace Pride is uh, staying on top of these things as much as we can. We've been quite busy with a number of things. For example, we now have an app online, which is from our website as well, but we'll be able to send out notifications to our, to our members about different things that are happening. We, here's a, here's a picture of it, as you can see. Okay. So next one. Yes. So in August, Workplace Pride is going to be uh, working with Copenhagen 2021 for the World Pride. And there we'll be working with many of our members as well as other organizations 
to focus on LGBTI inclusion on a global basis again. It's in Copenhagen on the 18th of August. And next one. Uh, very happy to say that we'll, at, in Copenhagen, be launching a white paper on LGBTIQ plus corporate advocacy, which we're doing together with IBM. This will really be about how businesses around the world, which we've heard about a little bit today, can influence legislation. So very relevant for some of the topics we've been discussing. Another thing that we're, we'll, we will be launching at the same event in Malmo the following day on the 19th is our toolkit for corporate social, uh, excuse me, for uh, uh, civil society organizations. This is a business resource toolkit that helps civil society organizations know how to work better with the corporate world or the private sector because it is a challenge for them. And so we're working with Open for Business, uh, with the Global Equality Fund uh, to, to get, and also the other foundation in South Africa to get this going. And as Justice mentioned, we're very, very proud to be part of the Free to Be Me project. It's a five-year project working in 14 countries in the global south. Uh, again, we'll be reaching out to our members and other civil society organizations for this project to, it's all about economic development as well as many other topics on LGBTI inclusion. Uh, a bit of a heads up on the 29th or the 5th of, I'm sorry, the 29th of October or the 5th of D, uh, November, we'll be having our Leadership Awards Gala. We'll hopefully we'll be announcing the actual date in the coming weeks or so. And uh, a number of other activities. We have Women at Workplace Pride on the 28th of June, a uh, presentation at, uh, with, t together with w, w, sorry, NWO, which is the Netherlands Research Institute. Young at Workplace Pride, a mentorship program starting in July. And Academia at Workplace Pride will have a live event in September on the occasion of the opening of the academic year. Very proud, Tech at Workplace Pride is always quite advanced uh, with, their, with their planning. On the 18th of November in Eindhoven, there will be a, a, a conference with the title Different Kinds of Energy. Fantastic title, looking forward to that. And Finally, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who has been uh, taking part in the conference today. Starting off with our members here, you can see we've had quite a few members, uh, foundation members, many new members, which we're very happy to, uh, to welcome. And after this, we have our foundation partners, again, many new members from different places around the world, out, many outside of the Netherlands, of course. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our foundation leaders who really truly help through their contribution and through their work with our foundation help us change the, the landscape for LGBTI workplace inclusion. So finally, once again, thank you to our speakers, to the panelists, thank you to the board of Workplace Pride, the advisory board, the foundation board, thank you to the Workplace Pride staff, and thank you to all of you for coming here on this hybrid event, and thank you online to everybody who's looking for wherever you are. Uh, for, for joining us today. Thank you very much.